Hotep, everybody. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. It is Sunday, September 25th, 2022, and I'm here with one of my teachers, one of our Grandmaster Scholar Warriors, Professor James Small. How you doing today, uh, Professor I'm James good, Small? Brother Hotep Michael. To you. That's fair. Good. Happy to be on with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, man, you and I have been going back and forth uh, talking, and we've been... Uh, talking about the uh, uh film of uh, the woman king okay mm. and uh we know the woman king uh debuted um on i think it was september 16th we know it came in uh number one opening weekend uh it'll probably do something like another 12 million uh this weekend and the film you and i have both seen the film uh mm. and the film deals with uh, the African kingdom of Dahomey. It deals with the uh, African female, uh, what are called African female warriors, the Ogoji. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about this movie. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, African themes, African culture, uh, dealing with African history, all this in the film. So I wanted to um, uh, bring you on uh, to uh, break down some more of this history explain to us the cultural influences that we see in the film and also separate fact from fiction as well and uh we, we're broadcasting on our facebook fan page the african history network the african history network as well as our youtube channel michael m hotep i m h o t e p and uh for those that may not be familiar with professor james small uh, i just want to give a brief introduction uh we've had him on the african history network show something like 12 13 times something like that uh, you've seen him in the Hidden Colors documentaries, the um, uh, documentary Happy, uh, which deals with the role of economics in the development of civilization from Taiki Grant and uh, Sister Felicia. And he and I are also in uh, the documentary Elementary Genocide Part 3, Elementary Genocide Part 3 from director Raheem Shabazz. Now, uh, Professor James Small is a scholar, activist, dynamic speaker, organizational uh, uh, consultant uh, also. Uh, he has been an activist since his teenage years. His in-depth knowledge, thought-provoking, and calm delivery are influential elements to break the programming of miseducation. He has studied extensively with Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Yosef ben uh, another one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who we've had on the show numerous times before as well, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, Dr. Asa Hilliard, Dr. Wade Nobles, who we've had on before, uh, Dr. Amos Wilson, and Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, who I had the pleasure of interviewing three times uh, also. Now, Professor James Small taught for 15 years at the City University of New York, including 13 years at the City College of New York's Black Stud Studies Department, where he taught courses on Pan-Africanism, Malcolm X, and on comparative African religions, which included several African spiritual systems titled African Religion and Survival, and, two, and he taught two years at New York City uh, Technical College teaching the course African Folklore and Religion, both in the diaspora in, and in Africa. Um, he's traveled to Africa numerous times. He is also currently conducting, well, he, he has taught online courses on African spirituality covering the Yoruba, uh, Yoruba Ifa tradition, the Akan spiritual tradition, Vodun and ancient Egyptian uh, sacred science. And also he is the historical consultant on my favorite show, Godfather of Harlem on ethics. Okay. I can't wait for uh, the new season to start up in January, 2023. All right. So once again, we want to welcome to the African history network show. Uh, one of my teachers, one of my friends, uh, professor James small. All right, brother. So thanks for taking time out today. Um, yes, brother Michael. Yes, sir. So you, you've you seen, and, and, and everybody uh, watch it, let us know how the audio is. I want to make sure you can hear uh, both of us. Um, so you've seen the film, uh, The Woman King. So we're going to start off from the beginning. Uh, what were your thoughts on it? People already know what I thought about it. I did a three-hour broadcast last Sunday on the African History Network show. So what were and your you, thoughts, you initial thoughts? Crazy. Well, That's the first you thing I want to mention, because a lot of people mm -hmm. um, fail to mention it when they do my biography. Okay. I'm the, I'm the successor to El Hajj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X. Yes. At age 21, after his assassination, I became the Imam of the Muslim Mosque, Inc., where I served 11 years while serving 18 years as his sister Ella's bodyguard. 
Right. I saw that in the bio. You told me don't read the whole thing. Yeah. So but that's just... part of my foundational piece. Right. And I just want to mention that because in The Godfather of Harlem, Malcolm mm -hmm. will be assassinated mm -hmm. in this uh, last episode that's coming up. Mm -hmm. And we're really trying to do that in a way with dignity to him and the family and not the usual stuff we see. Right. I just want people to know that I come from that. That's my birth space. Right. You know, exactly. Exactly. Right. exactly. I, I, I saw the movie. Mm -hmm. I did a couple of talks on it. People just caught me off guard. I sent a couple of people to it because usually I don't go watch too many black movies because mm -hmm. the wrong people are <laughs> producing and directing and paying for it. Right. So I sent a couple of the brothers from the Sons of Africa to watch it, come back. Give me a good, and they had a good report and some friends called who I love and trust and they loved it. Mm -hmm. so I did a couple of shows without seeing it and I realized something this significant you can't do that with. Right. So I went yesterday myself and I mm -hmm. sat quietly and I was blown the hell <laughs> away. You know? Exactly. I mean, everybody know I love Viola Davis. I mm -hmm. mean, if, the, if her husband say, I'm divorcing by all of the day, I'll tell Carol, you're going to have a second wife in the house if I'm going to propose tomorrow. <laughs> um, she is one extraordinary actress. Yes. One hell of a professional when it comes to this industry with all the things I've read about her. Mm -hmm. But watching this performance, just like you don't get no better playing a role. Right. From, from start to she don't let up you know right from the opening right. line to the last moment this woman is portraying that general who would then become the king and the one thing i'm going to say to our people a woman king is not an anomaly in africa we got women right. kings in africa right now Matter of fact, one exactly. of them is my goddaughter, Diambi, King of the Congo. Okay. Mm -hmm. what's, her na what's her name again? What's her name again? Diambi. Diambi. Yeah. King Diambi. She's king of the of the Order of the Leopards. She sits yeah. on the throne that once held by uh, Nzinga and expanded into the total of the Congo itself. Right. Uh, she's from the Luba people in the southeast, where she's a queen of the Luba kingdom, but mm -hmm. she's king of the Congo kingdom. Hatshepsut in early Egypt was the king of Egypt. Right. And we know of at least three to four other female kings of Egypt before Hatshepsut. All right. Yes. Right now there's at least five woman kings in Nigeria in the different kingdoms. So this is nothing new. Yep. If you understand African culture, and you can take this back to a set in ancient Kemet. Right. The woman is the power. Mm -hmm. And she gives to the man the authority. The exactly. operating from the throne is authority. But being granted that authority comes from the power, which is the female structure in African society. Let me right. show how it works in, say, Ghana, and then we'll come back to the movie, right? Okay. Let's take the okay. Ashanti Nation, the Asantehene, King of Kings of the Asante Nation, gets to be the king because he's a son of a sister of the king he's replacing. So right. multiple men are raised to be king, but at the end of the day, the women who raise them choose the best, most ethical, most prolific, most, you know, most prepared one and recommend that person to the men to be in stool. Only the women can bring you to kingship. The men right. carry out the ceremonial process, but it is the power that grants the man the authority. Take it all is the way it? back to Kemet. Mm -hmm. A lot of people is into Kemet lately. Go back to ancient Kemet and you will see a set sitting and she has a chair on her head. That's the throne of Earth. That's the throne of Africa. Right. The chair on her head is a symbol that she, the woman, is the throne. So who's the king of kings in 
ancient Kemet, right? The king of kings in ancient Kemet, every king has to become who? Haru. Haru, Haru. sits yep. on the lap of Aset because the lap of the woman is the throne of earth. See, mm-hmm. that's African understanding of culture. Right. And when you sit on that throne, right? Mm-hmm. You do not sit as yourself. You sit as your ancestors. Yeah. Right. That right. that's that you right here. That's that that's Haru sitting mm-hmm. on the throne. The throne of earth is a set. And right. when he sits on the throne, he's sitting on the throne as the ancestors because a set represents the line to divine itself, which is the primary ancestor of the human race. So right. That's what African spiritual culture about kingship is all about. And if you understand this, it's easy to understand why there's a woman king being exalted in this movie. Yes, a lot of the movie is fiction, like most movies are. Correct. But a lot of it is historical. Right. Um, Even if the timeline may not be on, the events is historically rooted. And right. then when you look at the cultural pieces, which we could talk about as we go along, I mentioned Correct. some up front. Mm-hmm. There's a young man named Malik. Yes. And you'll find a young lady who would become known as the daughter uh, to the general who's paid, played by Sister Viola. She, on occasion, because she developed a friendship with this young man, gives him a statue of Ogun. Right. Ogun is one of the primary orishas and deities of the Yoruba tradition or the Ifa tradition. And you'll hear them talk about the Ifa tradition throughout because that is the spiritual tradition of Dahomey because Dahomey is an extension of the original Yoruba kingdom. Right. right? Matter of fact, it was founded by one of the sons of the founder of the Yoruba kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so that tradition is there. And what are you going to see happen to the young man in the movie is he will transform from a young man coming from Brazil whose mother is African, who had been enslaved, and right. whose father was European. But on her mother deathbed, her mother told him he needed to go back home to find himself, go back yes. to her land, her home of the homie, because that is his home. And so... The statuette that she gives him is of the one Orisha that is the primary Orisha of transformation of the human character. Mm-hmm. And you will see the transformation of Malik yes. as you watch the movie. It's just beautifully done. This, this is what I've been talking I don't about. Know the director? <laughs> I've heard of her. Gina Price, Gina, Gina Prince Bythewood, right. who directed okay. Love and Basketball. Okay, so African American woman, love, just so people don't that, know. I love that piece, right? Yes. Um, but I've been working in studio with Godfather every day, mm-hmm. 12 hour mm-hmm. days sometimes, mm-hmm. going on now three years and working on the project with the writers and others for the last six years. So I've right. learned a lot about how this thing works. And what I saw yesterday in the theater, mm-hmm. those black women. <laughs> kicked butt and putting together a document that every black person should be proud of. Exactly. You see, I see a couple of little flaws, but I'm not going to even mention them. You know why? Right. Because it's overridden by the positive to such an extent. They're not noticeable in your consciousness. That's what I've been saying. Exactly. And, and here's the thing. So I have a million, you know, we have a million followers on our, our fan page, the African History Network. So I've been posting a lot about the movie. I saw it, mm-hmm. been posting articles about it, video mm-hmm. clips, uh, parts of interviews with Viola Davis, things like this. And mm-hmm. 99.9% of the people who saw the movie love the movie. They say they were blown away by it. And then I talked to, I talked to people who at first said they weren't going to see it and they saw the movie. They were blown away by it as well. Okay, this no, is phenomenal. That was me. I wasn't initially going to see it. Mm-hmm. Said, well, you know, I'm tired of them doing the smile in your face and poisoning us on the back end, right? Right. That didn't happen this time. What I saw this time was black artists, black craftsperson, black technician, black mm-hmm. actors doing an interpretation in fiction and history with 
African folklore that you just got to see to believe. And so I call all my children said, take my grandkids. Buckle right. up, look up, take my grandkids. They got to right. go see this piece. Right, exactly. And I don't do that very often because I'm not a movie goer. I don't mm -hmm. even go to the movie. Right. But exactly. this one um, treated African history with what I like to call African integrity. African integrity. The African integrity was so glowing. And, and not just the visual, but in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. you, you heard this praising in the dialogue. Um, this African dignity in the dialogue. This African yes. love in the dialogue. I go like, damn, this is really good. And I found right. myself crying on more than one occasion. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. Right. I, I cried at the I end. I shed some blue, tears at the end. my breath a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I was hit so heavy because, you know, I love, you know, I love African history like you. Right. I absorbed exactly. myself in it. I live it. And that movie had me reeling. And I've been to Benin. Mm -hmm. you know, I've been to Dahomey. I've been in the very palace they shot the film in multiple times. Yes. You know, I've been before the voodoo Pope on my knees to be blessed because I'm a voodoo at that, you know, not a priest. I'm going to okay. the one who practices, who, who knows the tradition. A um, Vodun. A Vodun? Vodun? Yes. Well, okay. the, the state religion in Benin is Vodun. Vodun, right. Vodun is, an, is, the, is the Dahomey um, manifestation of what we call Europe. Yeah. Same the tradition, spiritual system. But, mm -hmm. but manifest different in different cultures, different locations. You know, it's right. the Iba right. at the end of the day. And, right. um, and the word Vodun and that language means the essence of the divine within either nature or the human being. Mm -hmm. That's what the doom means, the essence of the divine. Right. Well, uh, and, we're going to we're going to go. I'm going to go to the official synopsis of the movie to give some people uh, uh, the background information on the movie, on the synopsis. And then right. we're going to continue. I want you to explain African integrity in just a minute. But first, I got to recognize uh, my friend, and you know him also, Professor Hunter Adams. He's watching right oh, now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. <laughs> Professor Hunter Adams, thanks so much for watching. He said, I agree, Professor James Small. <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, let's look at this here. So, the official website is thewomanking.movie, thewomanking.movie. I want to look at the official synopsis, and then we're going to delve deeper. Uh, because one of the things I want to uh, just briefly explain to people is um, when you hear that a movie is based on a true story, right? You really have to understand what that means because there are four different types of true story screenplays. There are four different uh, types of ways to, to tell the story. And it's okay. So uh, The Woman King is the remarkable, this is the official synopsis. The Woman King is the remarkable story of the Agoji, the all female unit of war what they call warriors who protected the african kingdom of dahomey in the 1800s with skills and a fierceness unlike anything the world has ever seen quote unquote inspired this is this is the key word everybody inspired by true events the woman king follows the emotionally epic journey of general naniska uh played by oscar winner viola davis and who it was her production company her and her husband julius their production company that produced this film as she trains the next generation of recruits and readies them for battle against an enemy determined to destroy their way of life some things are worth fighting for it's directed by gina prince bythewood who's an african-american female woman uh story played by maria bello and dana stevie stevens two white women and uh produced by kathy schulman viola davis husband julius Tennant, and maria bello Okay, so the reason why I wanted to go through that, uh, Professor Small, very quickly here, is, um, and I've done a ton of research on on the film as well. Um, there is, I, I, I've experienced this before with other movies, and mm -hmm. you, you have to be careful when you hear a term like "based on a true story." You have to really understand what the, what it is. So, very quickly, there are four ways to tell these historical movies okay this is a good article everybody can read it's from screencraft 
www.thepeopleshow.org. Is your script based on, quote unquote, based on or inspired by a true story? What's the difference? So you have based on a true story, you have based on true events, you have inspired by a true story and inspired by true events. Those are four different types of ways of telling a story. Mm -hmm. Each one has different levels of fiction interwoven into them. The, the woman king, according to the official synopsis, is inspired by true events. OK, I want to briefly explain what that means. Screenplays don't come as loose as the term, quote unquote, true as they do with stories, quote unquote, inspired by true events. OK, this is not the attack of woman king. I just want people to understand this. These scripts take a true event. We can blow this up even more. These scripts take a true event and tell a cinematic story with nearly all fictional characters and fictional macro events. Okay. So once again, um, I study a lot of movies. I've done lectures dealing with different movies. So you just have to understand how they're telling this movie is it based on a true story is it based on true events is it inspired by a true story or inspired by true events inspired by true events by definition based upon the industry is going to have more fiction in it than the other ways of telling these stories okay go ahead professor small well the key thing because i've worked with uh, uh the godfather of home yes and exactly it's based on true events Yes. And in, in The Godfather of Harlem, we we really do the autobiography of Malcolm X. We've actually mm -hmm. devoted more time to doing that than any other cinematic production ever. OK. Um, he and Malcolm X have been in something like about. Twelve episodes, mm -hmm. also, no, 22 episodes when it's over, 22 or 23 episodes of this right. piece. And mm -hmm. my fighting there is to keep what I call African integrity and historical authenticity, which is okay. not easy, okay? Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 but it has gotten easy because um, the writers are both black and white, 50%. But they come mm -hmm. from- On, the, on Godfather of Harlem, on Godfather right, of but Harlem. But they come from yes. the, the, the industry's protocols. So here comes mm -hmm. this guy from a black studies, black nationalist background, who knows nothing about writing, but want to see images on the screen that reflect African integrity, you know, and reflect right. the the historical authenticity that I think it should. But it's right. fiction. It's like, how do we take Malcolm X? How do we take Adam Powell? How do we take Bumpy Johnson? and create a mm -hmm. fictional story about a gangster who partners with civil rights and, and human rights leaders to get control of Harlem from the white operators of Harlem. Right. How do you tell that fictional story using these historical characters and some historical events? Mm -hmm. and, and sitting, most of my work is done, even though I go in studio every day, my work is done with the writers in the writer's workshop, before it gets to a director, before it gets to uh, 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 the big boys to say, OK, this is cool. And so that's where we get a chance to say, this is what the dialogue is going to look like. This is what the scene is going to look like. This is what's going to be in that room. This is what the costume is going to look like. This is what the attitude is going to be, et cetera. And so when I'm watching this piece, having spent so much time in Togo, Benin, in Ghana over the last three decades. I'm there. I mean, I'm transformed out of that theater. <laughs> I'm right. in that palace in Dahomey where I've been multiple times. Um, and I'm feeling the spirit of the Agoji. Because mm -hmm. I've heard them talk about it so often. They lecture to us when we go there. Uh, the king even engaged in the lecture with us so that we begin to appreciate the history. Mm -hmm. It is not a myth that there was a woman army or women brigades that was a part of the greater the homie army. It wasn't a complete woman army. They had men too. But the right, women exactly. brigade, the men made up the infantry. The women mm -hmm. made up 
the battle soldiers, and they were fierce. Right. And and they do little demonstrations for you when you go to visit, you know, and you begin to appreciate this. And I'm watching and it goes. And I've also studied like you, many mm -hmm. of the rebellions and the resistance on the ground in Africa before we got on the slave ship. Many of the wars, many of the jihads to try and stop right. the slave trade, which had been right. going on for 1500 years plus before 1492. So we had been at war for a long time against this thing. I, I right. think the places where we saw part of the resistance up in northern Ghana and 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 and, and uh, other areas where the people build houses without windows, if you can imagine that, right? Mm -hmm. And the fence around the house is ten foot tall. The housing compound is ten foot tall, but the gateway to get in the house is two feet tall. So you got to get on your knees to crawl into the, the, the courtyard. So right. an enemy would lose his head trying to come down, you understand? But that was a defensive mechanism that our people put in place. They had the windows on the roofs, the roofs open up so that they could get sunlight and air. And they just had slit in the walls to use their arrows. So we resisted. So the phenomena that is being portrayed is not abnormal nor unusual. The unusual thing is, is that there is an army that have a significant female presence leading it. Mm -hmm. And in this story, the story is about an extraordinary female general who would become king. Right. The woman and king. Yep. The woman king. Mm -hmm. And so the storyline itself of how they trained and, and the dignity that's required and the discipline that's required and the sacrifices that's required of these women. You can't get married. You can't have children. You have to devote right. yourself to this because this is your devotion to saving the kingdom of Dahomey, protecting the kingdom of Dahomey, not just and protecting our king, but not just the king. And Viola in the dialogue, they take it to another level when she's talking to the king. He says, we're not just going to stop slavery in Dahomey. We're going to mm -hmm. stop slavery throughout Africa. You know? Right. It's not just going to be right. our people we're fighting for. We're going to fight for any people. Mm -hmm. If this wasn't real history, I would want it to be. Exactly. Okay? We've watched exactly. Wonder Woman. When I mm -hmm. was a child, I love Wonder Woman when I was a child. The Amazons. Yep. All right. We've watched yep. Supergirl. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? They were fictitious right. stories about white women heroes that was saving the white community. That's right. cool. Now we got this massive black group of heroines <laughs> saving right. the black community. Psychologically mm -hmm. in your head, something is being planted that you didn't come into this without a fight. And right. our women, we live in a society that marginalized women across the board, but particularly right. marginalized African women both historically and currently. And to see a piece that raised African women to the level they deserve to be on, because mm -hmm. historically they were mm -hmm. those women. That's not a myth. There was the right. female army and they right. were one of the best in West Africa. That's not a myth. Um, you had females in the Egyptian army. That's not a myth. You had right. females uh, Amanatu, who led the, the Northern Nigerian army against the Islamic incursion. That's not a myth. You had a, a female warrior who led the Moorish army against the Abbasid invasion into North Africa in the 800. That's not a myth. Right. But we have more data and information on that homie than we have on any of those other spaces. And the writers and the director have put together a piece showing what could have been maybe was to some degree on the part of the women who represent that element of society that was involved in the military defense of their nation and the projecting and protecting of their culture and their race and it was just done beautifully i just i, I went in exactly. thinking i was gonna be critical mean and hard like, like <laughs> i came out of there crying like a baby i was like damn <laughs> you know, this just took it off just stick it out. Um, exactly. And there was so much 
African culture, so oh, many references to history. Talking about Ifa. Mm -hmm. You saw the shrines. I've, those shrines were authentically done. The altars were authentically done. I saw multiple right. deities on the altars, you know. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and let me just talk to some deities, like the king, when the king sits on the throne, he doesn't sit, like say, Brother Emhotep is made king of Chicago. Well, he, right. when, when he's talking to me and you in the living room, he's Brother Emhotep. But when he sits on the throne, he is the ancestors of all of us speaking for those ancestors to us and carrying out of the will of the ancestors for us. So that's the role of a king in Africa. Not a despot that's trying to be rich and wealthy, but that's, that's not the African story. The king has no wealth in Africa, in the African traditional sense. He's taken care of by the community. He has no need desires, because they take care of his right. need desires. But his responsibility is to interpret mm -hmm. the ancestral will and wisdom to his community both as okay. priests and as jurists, because he's the head of the court in the community. That's the case right. in Africa, male or female. Yeah, you know, a lot of our understanding of the term king comes from a European perspective, yes. not from an African cultural perspective, because I saw a lot of comments saying, oh, it's the woman king. They're trying to emasculate the men and things like this. and. I saw the movie. That that was that's not the case. That don't Go happen. ahead. That don't happen. Matter of fact, in the movie, the man is helping to train the women. Mm -hmm. In the right. movie, that's the man is fighting beside them as the as the lead musketeers that opens the way for those warriors to come in to play. Right. Um, so and all through the movie, you see that partnership between the general who leads the women and the king who she and those women serve. And then I right. saw nothing emasculating or demeaning uh, at all. I saw a partnership that simply told, told a fictitious presentation of, an, of a reality. There's a reality mm -hmm. of those women warriors. It was a reality of that army being made up of warriors who were women and that they were considered by history, both white and blacks writing at that time as being one of the most fierce army in the field. The only thing Absolutely. that stopped them was the, the gun technology of Europe. Right, exactly, exactly. Okay, this, this is what I want to do, because uh, we're going to come back to this and we're going to deal with some more of the history of um, of uh, Dahomey. Uh, and I want to show a picture of the actual Goji. There are some good articles uh, written. Uh, Smithsonian Mag has a really good one. Uh, with the Smithsonian Institute, they have a really good one dealing with the real warriors behind the woman king. It goes deep into this history. But uh, you mentioned um, in Nigeria, and we, you and I talked about this on the phone. Uh, so I posted this article a few days ago because I saw so many people, most of them didn't see the movie, saying, oh, they don't have women kings in Africa and things like this, right? So there are a number of different articles on this topic here. This one here is from... Uh, gboa.com g-b-o-a-h.com check out the seven beautiful nigerian female kings in charge of their kingdom okay and it goes through and lays them out uh and, and where they are in nigeria this is right now this is not 100 years ago this is this is right now okay why why do you think so you talked about hashepsut uh in ancient kemet OK, so she was um, t t tell us a little bit about Hatshepsut. She would be considered a woman king. We know she was uh, the pharaoh uh, is the king pharaoh and she the pharaoh. Yep. The, pharaoh. Mm -hmm. the woman is the power in Africa. Men, yes. give up your European genital danglings because the, the power has nothing to do with gender. OK, right. It has to do with roles in nature. Mm -hmm. roles in nature you came from the womb and the belly of a woman it is not exactly. from your belly even though your sperm fertilized the eggs that became you so let's look at how africans looked at reality we were in partnership with nature and cosmology that's our culture is based on understanding cosmology and nature and so when we look at the the king and 
as we see in that chapter, her brother was too young to take the throne. He was too young to handle that responsibility. And so she, as the elder sister, had to take on the responsibility of being the pharaoh, of being the king. And then her brother was trained enough and old enough to take over the role of kingship himself. And I remember when we first started studying uh, ancient Egypt, and the white writers of all said, oh, the brother came in and he hated his sister and he scraped the name off the walls. All of that is proven to be untrue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all of it is proven to be untrue. That's not even African culture. That's European culture. That's what they do. Exactly. That's not what happens in African culture because the kingship is a spiritual position, not a political position, though they do political work. The king is surrounded by a council of elders who instructs and informs him, okay, on mm -hmm. his behavior. His job right. was to sit as the ancestors come back. I know this for a fact mm -hmm. because I've been trained at the stool in Ghana, Amnana Kofiampansa, the second of the Ogogo stool, under right. the kingship of Akua Kusapam. And one of my great teachers is Nana Kwabana and Ketsia the fifth, who's the king of Esokado in the Western region. So we talk about these things all the time, you know, because these right. are my questions. Um, and so if one thing this movie would do, it forced us to study our history before we got to North America and, and culture. And then I'm history and culture. Yep. Because because a lot of this, you know, because of we've all been attacked by white supremacy and racism and yeah, it's made us we, paranoid about anything. Well, well, not only that, we've internalized white supremacy. We've internalized to various extents white male patriarchy. So we don't see it, it. We don't see many of us don't see African women as equals. Right. And then you hear woman king and you say, oh, they're trying to emasculate the man. Right. Things like this. And then you have people say, oh, there were no women kings in, in, in Africa. And I'm like, oh, what are you talking this, about? <laughs> this, if, and we always praise many people. They know Ya Santiwa. Ya Santiwa. And yep. they said, oh, well, she was the, the queen Shanti. mother. No, she was the queen mother until the king gets captured. Then she mm -hmm. became the king because mm -hmm. okay? it was the queen mother who made him king, who named him king. Once right. the British captured the, 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 the Santa Henny and there was no king on the throne, the responsibility of the kingship fell on the Asantiwa, the queen mother of Ajisu, and she right. became the leader of the army of resistance against British occupation in central Ghana. So when we studied mm -hmm. the history is just so beautiful when we study it and learn about our women and, and really get to see, oh wow. Exactly. We're not these other people's culture. We got our own culture. We have our exactly. own look at. We have our own way of knowing things. We have our own worldview that we have imposed for ourselves on ourselves. And this becomes so important. I saw somebody talked about the book Barracoon and talked mm -hmm. about um Kofi, this one brother who was so by some by the homies. Even in the movie, they treated this well because the current king in the movie is criticizing his brother who started this slave trade thing. And they're trying to figure out a way. Oh, Gezo, yeah. How do we stop it? And the woman mm -hmm. king, as she's now the general, is saying, we must find another way to have commodities that we can make a living of. And she sets up these palm oil plantations. Palm oils, yeah. To create an income for the community. And I think she had another, oh, she said we could sell gold as well to mm -hmm. get an income. And so they're looking at us and wait a minute, we are trapped because these people have put us into a situation. Now, if you study the history of Africa, coastal African peoples were basically fishermen. Most of the slave trading took place on the coast, and then they would go inland with their guns and weapons and capture people. The right. coastal people were subjugated. Yes, they were. Some of them were involved in the slave trade at the barrel of a gun mm -hmm. because they had been conquered and subjugated. Study the history, learn the history. And you might learn about Chief Sam, the guy man who brought three ships over here to take us back home, and you don't even know his name. So let's Face to Face Africa has an article about yeah, him. Yeah. Yep. Let's yep. talk about Bonsu. You said the Ashanti sold us. What about King Bonsu, who marched the Ashanti army from central Ghana down to the coast? emasculated the Dutch, took over the slave dungeon, 
drove them all out, free all of our people, then marched the army back up to uh, uh, Kumasi. Let's learn these stories. Let's mm -hmm. learn of these great heroes. We've got brothers selling drugs to us on the streets right now. We can't deny right. that black people do things like that. You've got black people killing more black people on the streets every month than was killing slavery any given month. We can't deny <laughs> that's so, but we got to understand why that's so. Right. And so we had some folks in Africa who was involved in slave trading, but that was mm -hmm. less than 1%. Let's right. talk about that 99% who were the victims or who were defenders of our people. Unless exactly. millions more would have got caught up and died in the slave trade. I'm going to go to that in just a second because I want to share an excerpt of the book, uh, Fighting the Slave Trade. Before we go to that, hey, everybody, uh, I'm Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. We're speaking with one of my teachers, Professor James Small. We're talking about the film uh, The Woman King, as well as the real history of the West African kingdom of, of um, Dahomey and other history also. If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign The AHN Show through Cash App dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting i've been hosting the african history network show for 12 years now so this helps us keep doing the research we also have the information at our website the african history network.com the african history network.com and just very quickly this is up for those that don't know this is our official cash app account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. When you go to it, it says Michael and it shows my picture there. These other ones, and there are five of them out there that are fake African History Network cash app accounts that have been stealing money from us. I've opened up an investigation with cash app. We're trying to get them shut down. So that's why I got the information here right on the homepage of our mm -hmm. website. Okay. Now, I want to uh, yeah. also my online classes that I teach you on our website as well. Go ahead, Professor Small. Yeah. Well. Someone said, as a black woman, my mm -hmm. femininity is important to me. Well, girl, go watch this movie because there ain't nothing yeah. more feminine than what I was watching yesterday. I didn't want to leave the theater. One right. thing this movie does not do mm -hmm. is demean the femininity of African women. Right. Okay. It, right. it, it is such a beautiful, the way they do it is so, I got to meet this lady who was the director. So beautifully done. G Gina Prince Bythewood, yes. Yes. So yep. beautifully done that the women, the warriors, do not lose their femininity, do not lose their sensitivity, do not lose their love of sisterhood um, mm -hmm. or motherhood. It's all through the piece. It is a well-done piece. It is worthy of watching. It is something right. that showed us that the movement of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s that produced opportunities for black writers, black directors, and black actors have paid off and is paying off so that we can get some credible quality uh, mm -hmm. cinema that mm -hmm. would be worthy of helping to socialize our community in a more positive direction. Absolutely. And uh, it, it, I think it's really important that you, that you said that there. Uh, I, I'm going to go to fighting the slave trade in just a second. But I'm just going to put this out here. And, uh, you know, I learned from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Higgins, and you know, Dr. Ray Higgins as well. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I may say some things that outside the circumference of your own awareness, just because you disagree with them or don't like them does not mean it's not true. You just have to do some more research to understand what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, because African Americans, because we're in this white supremacist system, this white male patriarchy system, unfortunately, many of us associate being feminine with being weak mm -hmm. and that's something projected to us by european culture and so then when we mama. that changed that. go ahead say that again say I that again need to meet my mama to find <laughs> if i wasn't her son i'd marry that lady and, <laughs> and my mama as well yeah she, exactly she, she would slap you into the next world if you step wrong you know right but <laughs> so when they see when they see african female women who can be the man's behind then all of a sudden they're not feminine and, and 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 we we associate femininity with being weak, and it's like no, that's coming no, no, from no, no. that's coming from the white. I think I think you used the, front, the, the phrase white murder culture. Yeah, <laughs> that's coming. Kind of, no, if they want to <laughs> see a, about that an, an example of that, they need to see the woman I've been married to for fifty one years. All right. <laughs> right. But I remember she was pregnant with our twins, coming right. home, and she got mugged by this dude. 
Right. He put up a fight, but he got away with the purse. But she was coming from mm -hmm. the Nation of Islam fish store. She chased this dude six blocks with this frozen writing. <laughs> he dropped that purse. He got, this lady got to be crazy with that big belly right. and that frozen fish, right? So, right. Um, me and well, was laughing about that last night, talking about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and because of what we go through in this country and because of our history, you should want a sister who can fight. You should want a sister who can help you defend the home and things like this, unless, unless, you, unless you want to oppress the sister. Okay, unless you're afraid you, she's gonna whip your behind because maybe you did something wrong or something like that, right? But you should want a sister who can fight. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> all right. Uh I want to go to this right here. This is a, a excerpt of um the book Fighting the Slave Trade by mm -hmm. a brilliant sister, Dr. Sylvia Dioff. I you and I talked about this briefly today. Um, it, this, this is the synopsis that is at amazon.com. You can try to get it from an African American book dealer. If not, maybe Amazon fight. It's called fighting the slave trade, West African strategies. This is going to segue into a further discussion with the home and their involvement in the transatlantic slave trade, professor small, uh, fighting the slave trade, West African strategies. Uh, this book came out in 2003. Sylvan D. Off is a brilliant sister. I'm trying to get on the African history network show. She's the author of many books books. Here's the, here's the official synopsis of this book. Um, while most studies of the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade specifically, focus on, uh, focus on captives and on their ethnic origins, the question of how the Africans organized their familial communal lives to resist and assail the transatlantic slave trade has not received adequate attention. How Africans fought back against this. By our, but, but our picture of the slave trade is incomplete without an examination of the ways in which men and women responded to the threat and reality of enslavement and deportation. Fighting the Trade is the first book to, possibly so, this came out in 2003, Fighting the Slave Trade is the first book to explore in a systematic manner the strategies Africans use to protect and defend themselves and their communities from the onslaught of the transatlantic slave trade and how they assaulted, how they fought back against the transatlantic slave trade. It challenges widely held myths of African passivity and general complicity in the slave trade and shows that resistance to enslavement and to involvement in the slave trade was much more pervasive than though that then has been acknowledged by the orthodox interpretation of historical literature focused on west africa where dahomey was and benin currently is focused on west west africa the essays collected here examine in detail the defensive, protective, and offensive strategies of individuals, families, communities, and states in chapters discussing the manipulation of the environment, resettlement, the redemption of captives, the transformation of social relations, mm -hmm. political centralization, marinage, violent assaults on ships and intrapots, shipboard revolts like the Amistad slave uh, slave rebellion 1839 mm -hmm. and controlled participation and controlled participation in the slave trade as a way to procure the means to fight to attack the slave trade fighting the slave trade presents a much more complete picture of the West African slave trade than has been previously available go ahead professor small yes sir I mean and it's and it's like we 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 make the mistake when we just hear a cliche or a term. Most right. people who never heard the word Dahomey until a month ago, all of exactly. a sudden now is telling us how Dahomey was in the slave trade. Dahomey mm -hmm. came to power politically around the 1720s, 1730. It does not get involved in the slave trade because it doesn't build up a military with the capability until around the 1760s to 1780s. That is mm -hmm. over by 1825. 
Now, we're not talking about an appreciable amount of historical time. If you put everything in history on a timeline, you get a sense of what I'm talking about. And then the numbers, you know, we you look at the numbers. How much, what was the numbers? 5,000, 10,000? Even that would be too much. But if we look at the numbers, let's stop playing. If you understand how, how the European works, and the best way I can do it, go to the country where I have a hotel, I have a business, I have a home, and I've been back and forth living there for 30 years, Ghana. Uh, what they do, they conquer the coastal people and subdue them right. with their military technology. And then they force these coastal people to engage in the slave trade with them for their life. And as you saw that piece you just read, the coastal people also find ways to fight back. This right. was the Fonte Nation, where the Almina Castle was built, the slave dungeon, and where the Cape Coast slave dungeon was built. And what the Fonte would end up doing with the Portuguese, behind the Portuguese back, they partnered with the Dutch and helped the Dutch defeat the Portuguese and drive them out of West Africa. But because of gun technology, again, they were betrayed by the Dutch. You understand? Mm -hmm. And But right. they would then found a way to part and, and they found a way to then partner with the British to defeat the Dutch. And when they had enough knowledge and understanding of technology and gun warfare, that same Fonte people drove the British out of Fonte region in Central Africa, forcing them to run to Accra for their life in one of the first classical guerrilla warfare scenes in history. So we need to study this thing. Yes, some of our people sell us drugs on the street, but you and I don't sell drugs to our people. Correct. You know, some of our people Correct. engage in careless uh, gun violence in our community that kills our women and our babies, but that's not 99% of our people. Right. Some of our people engage in the slave trade, some out of greed. I wouldn't deny that. Most out of duress because they were at the barrel of the gun of the enemy with the gun technology. But go down and just study. So you can look at something like the Battle of Islambada down in South Africa, where Setuweya takes on the British army with swords mm -hmm. and spears, killed 2,000 in one day, all right? And caused the fall of the Rospear government in London. And they were shocked, how could y'all let this happen? These folks ain't got no guns, you know what they called us, right? Go all the way up to where we're looking at the Berlin Conference. After the Berlin Conference, the invasion mm -hmm. of Sudan, uh, Muhammad Ahmed takes on 23,000 British troops and, and uh, Turkish Egyptian troops and send only 3,000 back up to Egypt alive. Talk about resistance. Go with Amanatu and, and um, the kingdom that was just above. Uh, oh, there's just so many episodes of the great heroine and heroes that fought in these wars of liberation and fought of slave resistance. It will, you will never sit back and talk about Africans sold us. Because guess who Africans were? That was your uncle, your cousin, your grandma, your brother, your great grandma. Stop being foolish and learn the history of the great right. people. The genocide would have been more pervasive had we not resisted in such a beautiful and strong way for so long. And we, fought, women, we fought every step of the way. And yeah, our, exactly. our women paid a, played a pivotal role not just in Dahomey, but in other kingdoms in that resistance movement, many of them being the generals at the head of armies. Mm -hmm. Learn their story, and you'll learn how to love yourself more deeply and appreciate well, we, respect. That's what I call African integrity. You know? Exactly. Um, when we look at uh, Dahomey, um, and Dahomey really comes to power about 1720, and they're going to defeat uh, a Wida. Um, how do you pronounce that? Wida. Uh, okay. There's a couple of different uh, spellings of it. So, talk about um, cultural servitude versus chattel slavery. Right. Because we, because, because, because what happens is a lot of Europeans will say, "Oh, African Africans slave. are slave. Yeah. Africans have slaves. You, you all started this." Blah blah blah. Talk about the cultural servitude system. That Africans had compared to the child slavery that Europeans created. Right. Let me correct one sister so I don't break her heart. She said the okay. Portuguese built no castles, 
they built dungeons. Didn't you hear me correct myself? So stop playing it. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, I right. They built dungeons. But I understand. Yes. I understand. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, that's brother Leo. And and mm -hmm. of course, they built concentration camps. Yeah, I wouldn't right. even call them dungeons. They were concentration camps. But servitude, every society had it. Dr. Clark mm -hmm. taught us that Africans didn't have prisons. And the reason they didn't have prisons, because they right. had a servitude system when you committed a crime in the community. Or if there was a war between two groups, which was rare, because the way we fought war in Africa, the heroes fought, okay? Not armies. Africa had very few standing armies. That's why we okay. took such a weapon. We learned to develop standing armies after the invasion started, but even Egypt didn't have standing armies until they got their butt kicked. And they realized mm -hmm. we got to build one. The only place where the spiritual foreseeing of, of the necessity for that was with uh, Shaka in Zululand, where the Shaka spirit Zulu. told him this force was coming and he developed a standard army to meet that force. But in most other okay. places, we didn't have a standard army. But what would occur when there was a conflict between two communities and one, and they had to go to war, the captives were brought to serve off almost like the indentured system structure the European had. Except in Africa, no one took your name away. No one took your family lineage away. No one took your mm -hmm. humanity away. No one took your spiritual identity away. And you can grow up to become the king of the very community that you are serving in. Right. Okay. You can grow right. up to marry royalty in the house in which you are serving to. That was the norm. The idea was you've committed a, a crime against the greater social order. And so you have to be transformed. Okay. You have to go through a transformation process and a socialization process that you can be a part of society without causing gross disruption of that society. And that servitude process that we see in multiple places in Africa did not involve putting you in prison putting you in chains, putting you before firing squads, or anything like that, mm -hmm. you know? Right. It involves you right. becoming a part of the very community you had the conflict with. And when your time of service was over, you can either go back to your home if that's what you wanted to do, or remain a part of this community if that's what you want to do. Right. So when we, uh, and I've talked to uh, Professor uh, Kabahai Wapakamane about this as well. You, you know him, and he's one of my teachers also. Um, the culture, and we see this in the film because there's at least, uh, actually, they, there's at least one uh, woman who's a goji in the film who came from uh, a, another ethnic group right. and there was there was a, a fight a fight between them she was captured and she was brought in to be made a goji mm -hmm. to, and brought in, and brought into that and brought into Dahomey mm -hmm. uh so so we see this take place uh now the Europeans had their um feudalistic system with right. the lords and the serfs right. okay and they're going to superimpose this feudalistic system right. onto the cultural servitude that Africans had to create chattel slavery, to create what we call chattel slavery, basically. Right. But uh, it, talk it, about that for a minute. It, well, it, you know, there, the European system was not about family structure. It was mm -hmm. about class and caste structure. Africa right. was not about class and caste structure. It's about family structure. So when you came into another community, that person's household you went into, depending on age strata, that was your father, that was your mother. That was your auntie. You were their child. Mm -hmm. That's the, what the European had was something completely different. Right. It was based on caste and class, depending on power and wealth. That was not what the African kingdom was built on. The African kingdom was built on the fact that the king itself is the father of the community because he represents the ancestors for that community. Africans don't have queens in the way Europeans do. The king's wife is not a queen. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, in, in the and, African society, the right. king's wife is in not a queen. In some modern day African society, who's starting to play the European thing, you see a little bit of that. But in traditional ancient African society, your wife is not the queen. She's just your wife. <laughs> okay. Right. 
the queen mother is your sister or your auntie or cousin. Okay. But your wife would never be the queen. And the reason they do that, so that 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 fighting for the throne thing never happens. So okay. it is the collective body of women called the Queen Mothers who select from among the best of the young men they have raised, because they know them better than anybody else, because they raised them from infancy, to be the next king. And if right. a man was not available to assume that responsibility, then they chose a woman who was skilled, trained, and tooled to carry that power and that responsibility, both spiritually, judiciary-wise, and politically. Okay, so this so this goes back to Osset with the throne on her head, absolutely. Because because Osset means the the, the the name I set for my understanding means she of throne, yeah. she of throne, she is and the throne, she is the throne. Yeah. Okay, she is the throne, and Meaning, the, no, it's, no, it's no, the she, woman. She is woman. She's not. There's nobody named Osset. Right. Osset is symbolic of the African woman. Right, symbolic of the African woman, because it's the African woman who decides which man will sit on the throne. Okay, all right, and and, and in many societies, is is so so, it, so is it that uh, in some societies, is it that the um, um, the lineage was matrilineal, which went through the woman side of the family, and As uh, we, said, we kept it in America. We had a, a kind of a term we used that that. People thought it was joking, mama's baby, daddy's maybe. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the way they solve the bloodline is to go to the one place where you know the authenticity of a bloodline. Right. And that means it's not matriarchal. Matriarchal means women rule. That's a white folks term. It's okay. They got the Matrilineal. No, it's matrifocal. 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 Okay. Meaning Matrifocal. you must train, you, you, you can, you, you trace the, and it is no denigration to the man. I love right. my wife, but I know it's the one way to be sure that this mm -hmm. child is who we say he is, is to see what womb the child came out of. Right. There's okay. no way to find out what sperm the child came from. And we okay. knew that way back then, when there was no microscope or nothing at hand, we were clear. <laughs> Okay. Right. <laughs> and so you're talking about matrifocal. Now, since okay. Islam, well, going all the way back to the, remember, we get the Hyksos invasion, the Greek invasion, mm -hmm. and right. well, well, first the Hyksos, and then you get two Hyksos, Hyksos. Hittites, you get two Hittites invasion in North, Northeastern Africa. Then you get the Assyrian, two Assyrian invasion. Of them. Then you get the Persians, two Persian invasion, then the Greek invasion, then the Roman invasion, and then their mm -hmm. children, their descendants, the Arabs. See, people right. don't know who the Arabs are. These are the descendants of the Greeks and the Romans and then and, and the Assyrians and the Hittites and the Hyksos mix up mm -hmm. now, marrying into one another. And then they hit us in the eighth yeah. century and have right. the deepest incursion into Africa. And that's where you see a lot of the patriarchal systems in the areas that was once conquered by Islam or still fundamentally Islamic in Africa. So you see the patriarchal right. thing. But in traditional non-Islamic Africa, it's matrifocal, almost 100%. Okay. Now, when, when we talk about Dahomey, I know you you and I were talking about this earlier today, and Dahomey is made to be, and I see like some European writers doing this. I see this in the media. Dahomey is being made out to be like, they were more involved in the, in the transatlantic slave trade than Great Britain was. Yeah, that, and Great Britain that, takes out like <laughs> they take out 3.1. Great Britain was involved from 1562 to 1834 when they finally, even after 1807, we'll talk about 1807 in just a minute. They involved for 272 years. Talk, right. talk, talk about Dahomey and how it gets involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Well, again, for the, the same reason, Dahomey in 1720, when the kingdom is formed. Mm -hmm. um, or when it when it comes to power, it was always a, a small kingdom. And remember, Dahomey wasn't the size of today's Benin. Right. It was a it was small a kingdom that. within that territory. There was right. Rida, Contenu, and other kingdoms on the coast that was rivaling them in terms of commerce and trade. But once right. the European came, the European 
got involved immediately in capturing Africans for the slave trade. And the first thing they would do was to bring to servitude the coastal population. Okay, that's the we okay. the continent because those people don't have guns. Gun so we can understand the degree to which gun technology plays mm -hmm. in the slave trade. Right. Okay. Fourteenth century came yeah. there with militaries, with cannons, and with guns. And in right. one day, they they can level all the African villages in in the community. People have never even heard an explosion before. You got to get the psychology of all of that. So once you find yourself being invaded and occupied by these people, and they, they they're making you a part of their army. So now mm -hmm. you're someone who you had a traditional argument with, and y'all would have a palava over it and, and settle it with somebody bringing some cocoa and something else. You got an army with people with guns now marching you against that folk. Right. and capturing those people and putting them in slavery. So by the time you get, and then the other piece we keep forgetting, and we need to call it out for what it is. There's an Islamic slave system in mm -hmm. place in Africa for 1500 plus years before 1492. There's the Trans-Indian right. Ocean slave trade there's the trans-Saharan slave trade. And before they were bringing Africans enslaved to North America, they were taking them enslaved to Europe. We never talk yeah. about slavery in Europe. You know, we try to play with the few people who call all oh, the Moors as a picture of a Moor, there's a statue of a Moor. No, we were enslaved in Europe. Mm -hmm. okay? That's the reason the Moors went into Spain. They were chasing the Bristogoth, the German, back out yeah. of North Africa. The Vandals so, and the Visigoths. Right. Yep. So mm -hmm. for the comeback, but to let people know about from the eighth century forward, Islamic nations have not invaded Africa. And one of the first things they do is get involved in this, putting us into slavery. They right. got into what we call today um, ethnic cleansing and cultural right. genocide. Cultural genocide right. imposing their religion on us and destroying our religious spaces. And, and those of us who resist was either killed or sold into slavery. So this has gone on right. for 1,500 years. So this is what the Africans got at his back when the Portuguese mm -hmm. have come. So we're looking at the Portuguese and them with some welcoming because we think we've got a force that can deal with the right. force that we've been dealing with. And we got right. part in the Catch-22 because those forces right. were in collaboration with one another. And no one okay. talked about that collaboration. Okay, so um, with the so with Dahomey, they the they have a cultural servitude system just like uh, African uh, African societies did. Anywhere in the Bantu area it was pretty much the same because the boundaries right. we see today, those boundaries weren't there then. Yeah, they come from the Berlin Conference largely. Right. Yeah, we're talking about the, the, the major empire which they're talking about in the films called the Oyo. Oh, that's what I was about to ask. Yeah, Talk, explain the Oyo Empire and the conflict between the Oyo Empire well, this is and the, the homie. the greater Yoruba nation. Right. Yoruba is and, not a religion. Yoruba is a people. Right? And, and just one second. Everybody watching, give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart uh, on this broadcast. Uh, go ahead, Professor Small. Answer that question. Yeah. I'll be right back. So you you, the, you the, go ahead. Keep the, talking. The Yoruba, the Yoruba nation and the founder of that nation had four sons who went out in different places and settled other lands and built other kingdoms. Well, Dahomey is one of those kingdoms that members of the Yoruba royal family developed and, and, and built. But over time, like what happens between many communities, conflict develop around trade, conflict develop around secession, conflict develop around all kinds of things. So Dahomey breaks away from the Oyo kingdom, okay? And, and, and so they, they, there's a conflict between them. But that even in the, the story, the, the fictitious thing of the Oyo Kingdom being big into slavery, they don't get into slavery until later on in the greater Yoruba Wars that would take place after this period of time that the Dahomey is, talk, is being talked about. But there's a conflict between Dahomey and the Yoruba land. Yoruba land is being invaded by the British, or by this time have been invaded by the British 
this is the great burning of Benin and the robbing of Benin of all of its wealth and art and so forth that we hear about in history, but we don't connect mm -hmm. it to nothing, right? But there's a greater Yoruba war going on between the people. And these boundaries called Nigeria, they're not there then, okay? Right. They're greater boundaries. People have other kinds of kingdom designs. And there's conflicts between some of these kingdoms, mostly around trade. But you got something else happening at the same time. As the Muslim wars of genocide and ethnic cleansing has taken place in the Nile Valley with the, the, the um, Mameluk Turks and the Saljuk Turks, and then finally the Ottoman Turks by the ninth, ninth century and the end, end of the ninth century, beginning of the 10th century, they're pushing right. millions of people out of the Nile Valley into West Africa. Y'all hear what I'm saying? They're pushing, pushing millions, millions of people out of mm -hmm. the Nile Valley into West Africa, in through Chad, in through Cameroon, into Nigeria, down into Ghana. This population, that through what is called Burkina Faso, this is the population of the people. Everybody always asks, what happened to the Egyptian? Well, we're talking to each other here right now, okay? Because a right. great number of those refugees millions of refugees scattered to the south and to the west because of the Turkish and the Arab ethnic cleansing that goes on for hundreds of years leading up to the 1400s are caught as the vulnerable population in what becomes known as the transatlantic slave trade. And I know a lot of us don't go there with that piece, but you've got to understand who are these people? And so the kingdoms like Dahomey on the coast Somebody coming from the north, that's the northeast, have brought captives that they want to sell to another right. community because they don't need that expansion in their population. And this, camp, this group of captives was either hostile to them or refugees that they felt was taking their space away from them. Okay. And that population, most time, that refugee population was at least able to defend itself end up being caught in the trade. And it wasn't a trade at all. It was a war of genocide against African people. There was no transatlantic slave trade. Nobody was trading anything. People were being right. captured. People were being murdered. People were being raped. Villages were being burned to the ground. Okay? People right. were being slaughtered to get enough so you could make two, three hundred dollars in that day's money, which would be a couple of thousand dollars in this day's money or for one human being to do labor in the Western Hemisphere, where he was worked to death in 10 to 15 years and would be replaced with someone else, a process that went on for 400 years plus. Exactly. So Dahomey got caught up in this. And what the movie shows, fictitious or not, they did do it. How do we get out of this? How do we work our way out, fight our way out of this contradiction? And I right. thought they did a beautiful job in describing the contradiction of, of, of the slave trade and describing the efforts of whatever African kingdom used that methodology to get out of the contradiction, whether it was Dahomey, Ashante, Yoruba, um, Igbo, Manding, mm -hmm. you know, we all so that, so, to get so that dealt with uh, that dealt with selling the palm oil. That they right. were selling the palm. Okay, so at what point does in in actual history at what point does the home get? So, so we know you have later you're going to have the Franco Dahomean Wars, 1890 mm -hmm. 1894, and the is going to be absorbed into the uh, I guess you would say French colonies of Benin. The home is of Benin. Yeah. Okay. So at what point does the home um, stop? um selling african captives to the europeans well they said the story in 1823 but it, that's I, where it starts open right. opens up but, 1823. but, but yes. that's not the real date the date would be mm -hmm. further back up all right um if, if 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 we were to look at that conflict played out we'd probably be looking at the homie would really the homie comes up as a kingdom in 1720 mm, 20 right but you don't have power when you come into being it takes you another 30 40 years to build up mm -hmm. an army to build up a front to build up a reputation so the homie don't really get into the slave trade thing until around 
the seven, you know, they try to talk about the kingdom starting in, in the 1600s. That's the extension of the Oyo kingdom. That's not the homie yet. The homie comes into its being in 1720 or so. It gets involved okay. near the end of the 1700s, about 1760 or so in the slave trade process. And then it's out of it by 1750, completely, 1752, okay? But in, in that period of time, there's the conflicts and the wars, because the Portuguese are not sitting there with merchants with banks and some money in their hand. They've come with armies with guns, all right? And they have right. people involved in this thing with weapons. And they've armed coastal people to go inland to capture other people for them. They've already depleted the coastal people they could take. But they need a coastal population because they need somebody who can speak the language, somebody who knows the terrain, somebody who knows the culture, etc. And they need numbers. And so they could take these captive people and make them their collaborators. Though many of those people will resist them and betray them. That's why it's important to understand the history because it's not a, a, a one look. You know? Right. You have to really see the intricacies of uh, resistance and rebellion and death. It's just like most people come to North America and say, well, y'all never really freed yourself. Well, you never looked at our history to say that. There's, there's right. recorded at least 300 plus African rebellions that was of significance in the United States, North America. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Civil War, over 300,000 of us fought in uniform with another four to 500,000 out of uniform behind the line, being workers, being supporters, being the people who carrying the equipment, so nearly a half a million plus of us is fighting in the Civil War to destroy the Confederacy. Both from the exactly. and out. That's a war of liberation on our part. Exactly. We, we fought to, to free ourselves. It, it wasn't right. given. Right. It wasn't it Abraham was Lincoln. Given. We fought to free and ourselves. We killed millions of white people, okay? So y'all need right. to stop it and really see what <laughs> happened here. And if you go back down to the British, we fought with the British who said, we're going to give you freedom. In the North, we fought with the British in the South. And the British, the people who fought with the North, you know, they ended up in Nova Scotia and then Sierra Leone. Nobody ever asked where the largest part of that black population went who was in the South. Because the largest part of the black population fighting against uh, America was not in the North. And you know where that population went? To Jamaica and to Trinidad. Okay. And they started the Poco Man movement in Jamaica. Those black Geechee Gala people who fought with the British. And in right. Trinidad, Tony Martin deals with this in his book. His last book, God Bless His Beautiful Soul, uh, History mm -hmm. of the Caribbean. He deals with the population that went to Trinidad, and I went to that community. And the streets are named after different military companies they fought in for the British. And when it was, right. you know, so don't tell me if you don't know history, you say we accepted this. But if you know history, this how the week went by when some black folks wasn't rebelling in North America. Well, the same and, thing and, went on in, in Africa. It would right. they go by where somebody wasn't killing an enemy, escaping from slavery, leading an army against the enslavers, putting up defense against enslavement, and that's all across the continent of Africa. And 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 here in the United States, especially other ways that we rebelled uh, against slavery, uh, learning to read and write was a way of rebelling against slavery. Mm -hmm. And one of the things many of us did when we learned to read and write, we, we wrote our own freedom papers and ran away also. Because oftentimes the uh, the slave patrollers, a lot of them were illiterate. Mm -hmm. They patrolled the roads, right. things like that. So you, then so you, you can give them with a, a stamp on and it was good to go. Yep, you can say this, this is your freedom but, paper. But, but uh, you the had resistance movement in Africa was extraordinary mm -hmm. because Africans didn't view human beings as commodity. That's culturally right. out of sync. Our okay. worldview right. didn't work like that. That's Right. You can't view Africa through European lenses. Otherwise, exactly. you're not going to even That's understand That's what true, resistance yeah. is. You know, to take a human being's name from them, mm -hmm. that's tantamount to slitting somebody's throat. Right. You don't, you don't take a human being's name. Your name is your ancestral lineage tag. Takes you back to God. Right. You know? And so if you just look at the African concept of being human, it didn't allow for chattel slavery to be a part 
of their consciousness. And even mm-hmm. those who got involved in that, that selling people as commodity, like for that period in Dahomey and that period in Ashanti and maybe some other places as well, one thing you will see for sure, they knew nothing about chattel slavery. They had not right. been on a ship coming to America. Not a single one of them owned the slave ship. All right. They didn't control the armies that was controlling the shores of Africa. These were all white foreigners with guns. They didn't own a single plantation in America or the Caribbean or Central South America. So let's stop giving ourselves excuses for why we can't look in the mirror and love ourselves. Because right. a lot, let me tell you what a lot of this is. This mm-hmm. resistance is self-hate. Correct. And, Correct. And, and, and someone is trying to say, stop hating yourself. But hating me felt so good. So it's hard to stop. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, and I'm saying, stop hating yourself. Take this tool. No, this movie is not perfect. It's not a panacea. It's not going to solve all of our problems about the slave trade or history. But guess what? You watch movies all the time and you enjoy them. And most of them are nonsensical. Uh, most of them disrespectful to black people. Um, mm-hmm. disrespectful to things African and our spiritual system, and you enjoy them. This one fight to be the opposite of all of that. Go in and enjoy it. I guarantee you, you'll come back and call Brother Michael. Say, Brother Michael, thank you, brother. <laughs> thank you, brother. Because I saw some black uh, technicians and some black directors and some black actors and actresses, and they put on a beautiful fictitious performance inspired by the history of our people, about our Mm -hmm. women who were extraordinary work. And see, the thing is, these women were considered by the whole world that found out about them to be the most extraordinary of extraordinaries. Right. It ain't that they didn't exist. They exist. Mm -hmm. And, And the little piece of them that we see in this film that talk about their principles, their integrity, their dignity, their training, their devotion, their loyalty to their nation and their king, that's just a tiny bit of who they really were. Right. Because if if we did not have these women, we would not have the woman who raised Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who was one of these women in Haiti. Mm -hmm to give us the Haitian Revolution victory. Yes. Was one of these women yes. from the Dahomey army who raised Jean-Jacques Dessalines. And my right. sister, um, Ezele Danto, is trying to get a piece out here. It, she's calling it the Dadas. It's about some of okay. these women. Yeah, I know, I know her. And yeah, Danto, I know Haiti. her. Yeah, mm-hmm. she's an extraordinary sister. Um, mm-hmm. The Free Haiti Movement is, is what she's, she's ahead of and and these women many of whom was a part of that fighting force who've now been captured and sold into haiti by the french they've not gotten old broken down can't have sex no more they can't be abused no more they can't work in the field no more so the catholic church takes them according to as they done so these ladies they call the dad and they <coughs> put them in a church lay organization to convert other young African enslaved women to Catholicism. But instead, mm-hmm. these very ladies, these former warriors, train the leadership that become the women leadership in the Haitian Revolution. Right. And many of the women they train marry the very generals we see as the heroes in the Haitian Revolution. This thing is bigger than you think it is, brothers and sisters. <laughs> exactly than you think it is um, right so if this movie does nothing else but make you pick up a book grab a mm-hmm. dvd and start studying listening to uh uh brother Carver, dr jeff yep. dr clark dr jacob yep. Rutgers, dr asa hilliard doctor you know right amos wilson um going back to yep. my brother in england with when we ruled um oh robin walker robin yeah walker. i got a book right behind me yeah. robin walker and and brilliant brother see that we have an extraordinary history we did not give up otherwise we would still be in slavery 
Right. We fought every single day from one end of Africa to the other, from one end of the Caribbean to the other, from one end of Central South America to the other, from one end of North America to the other. And we've mm-hmm. transformed the white world. And what's so right. beautiful about Viola and her husband and that beautiful director and the others, they took the content and white intent and transformed white content to an African intent that made sense. They interpreted it in a way that they took the, the, the intent of someone else's content, content being the writing that was done. And right. all content has intent. Right. And so I'm just assuming, given history, what the intent might have been, even if it wasn't deliberate, just culturally. And I know these Black folks took that content and redirected that intent to give us a cinematic document that I think is rather extraordinary. Okay, we're going to come back to that point in just a second. I want to go to this uh, clip here. This is an excerpt of the interview that Viola Davis did on Good Morning America because this gets deeper into it and she talks more about making the film. Before that, we, we don't want to forget the sisters. We mentioned a number, a number of brothers that are scholars. So Sister Nubia uh, Wartford from here in Detroit, Nubia Marinke, she's watching as well. She just saw the movie. You know Sister Nubia. Mm-hmm. She just saw the movie. She had extraordinary production. But also sisters like uh, ancestors like Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, and Dr. Um, uh, 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 Patricia, uh, Patricia uh, Newton. Uh, you've got, um, we have uh, Dr. Marimba Ani, okay, who wrote Urugu, an African Centered Critique of European Cultural Thought and Behavior. We have um, uh, Sister uh, Teaches the Meta Netter, I know her. Um, uh, um, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, um, Ricchetti. Dr. Oh, Ricchetti, I'm right. in. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Ricchetti, I'm in. So we so we have the sisters also, uh, Talita, uh, Dr. Uh, Talita uh, LaFloria, uh, whose book is behind me, Dr. Dani uh, Ramey Berry, uh, Dr. Erica Armstrong Dunbar. So we have the sisters also. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, those watching, uh, uh, those watching, if, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. And also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Uh, and visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have the information there and uh, my online classes. You can support us there also. How can people support you, uh, Professor Small? Well, always. Um, Donald Tan, catch up, Dr. James Small. Okay, I'm going to put that up here also. Yeah, but uh, sister, well, you're going to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, Sister Nubia, and how you doing, my beautiful sister, who's a heck of a historian. Yes. Palms of archaeology, doing research in Sudan, but the rest of us are even scared to go. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and she said, it is correct that only 4% of Africans across the continent were involved in the slave trade versus 96% Arab and European. And people need to know that. So if you right. think that 4% is big, just look at how much, what percentage of the black community sell drugs in the black community, right? To you every day, that's, <laughs> that's worse than any kind of slave trade. So yes, you right. will have people who are weak. Yes, you will have people who will fall. But let's not talk about the weak. Let's talk about the strong. And what this movie show is what a strong African woman look like. Miss Viola, yes. girl, every step you took in this movie made the earth think, <laughs> okay? Um, <laughs> And the young lady, who's the young lady that played her daughter? Uh, Mbedu uh, Thesu, I think is her name. She's from South Africa. Uh-huh. She's from South Africa, yes. She was brilliant. Um, mm-hmm. And the sister who played her big sister who died and in and, and saving her life, she was right. brilliant with the, the way she brought this con- sisterhood concept, motherhood concept of adopting the orphan bringing you into right. the family, taking care of you now. Uh, that piece that I grew up in on the plantation in South Carolina, that Africa, with so many of us grew up in, in Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas and Louisiana and, and Texas. Through, let's, yeah, stop, through, let's stop forgetting. Because we brought Africa right here with us and we behaved in a certain way. What made you think we right. behaved any differently at home? Right, exactly. Let's exactly. Stop it was Thusu Mbedu. She played uh, Nawi. 
yeah. uh, the, the, uh, yeah. Viola Davis's yeah. daughter. Uh, give us your cash app again, so I can put it up here, uh, Professor Small. What's your cash app again? Um, cash um, dollar sign Dr. James Small. Okay, uh, Dr. James Small. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, we'll put that up here so you all can support uh professor small also okay uh i want to go to uh i want to play a little excerpt of this uh interview, interview, yeah, uh, interview if, yeah. Uh, yeah um viola davis was on good morning america on september 13th 2022 and uh let's go to this clip here is a movement. This is so much more mm -hmm. than just a movie. And you yes. even talked about it being yes. so, so important to you and just that, that zenith for you. That sort of magnum opus, yes. I call it. Yeah. I think the same reaction that you have as an audience is the reason why I did the movie. First of all, it is a movie that's led by women. And it's a movie that's led by black women. And it's a movie that's led by dark skinned black women. There is no white savior, you know, and it's women who are warriors tapping into not only their physical strength, but also when you see the movie, they're humanized. And so when have you seen that? I remember someone online said, I'm tired of seeing dark skinned black women is just just strong and fighting and masculine. And I was like, when have you ever seen that? <laughs> <laughs> that really, yeah. you feel me? <laughs> we do now, we do now. And yes. what a cast you've put together to tell this story. Absolutely. Tuso Bedou, Lashana Lynch, <laughs> Sheila Etim, you know, Adrian Warren, who was in Tina Turner, mm -hmm. you know, um, as well as Sia, Shioma, Jamie Lawson, women who are beyond the brilliant, but also, I mean, women who are playing roles of our goji warriors mm. that literally, it could have been an action film. Mm. But when they walk in, you see people, mm. you see humans. And I think that's what shifts. You bring yeah. out the best in people because the critics are saying this cast, everyone mm -hmm. in every single role, the best. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, here's the thing. You know, as a woman, you're taught that being a girl and being feminine is not about tapping into your physical strength. It's about being demure, speaking in a high voice, being polite all the time. Whereas the challenge of the reason why I loved it so much is my body served me. Mm -hmm. And it was, I had to do five hours and wait for me <laughs> and martial arts every day. Is that all new for you? <laughs> Wait, man, you, you did that you did weightlifting you did sprinting you did weapons training but you also you have to take a dna test dna test which i didn't want to see <laughs> i didn't want to see i'm lactose intolerant i have a moderated injury i said i can't eat sugar i mean and i had to keep telling jana prince bites would great great director I had to keep calling her and say, Gina, Gina, listen, listen to me now. You know I'm 56. You know if I get on that treadmill at 9.4, I lose oxygen. <laughs> I could die of a heart attack, Gina. These girls are 30 years old. Gina, you got to do something else. You got to do something else. Gina. You're going to have a dead warrior here. You know? <laughs> Let's give everybody a look. All right. Your family, no wonder. Okay, so that's a, uh, that's an excerpt of a great interview uh, that uh, Viola Davis did uh, on Good Morning America. That's on the Good Morning America's YouTube channel. Uh, that's from September 13th, 2022. Okay, uh, any any comments on that uh, before I, I go to the uh, next uh, uh, topic? No, I think she, she said it all. I mean, this yes. is black <laughs> women having an opportunity to interpret mm -hmm. their racial history and at the same time to interpret the role that black women have played in history, are playing in history and could play in history. Um, right. You know, when we look at the civil rights movement in America, from top to bottom, there's that black woman. You know, exactly. um, when Marcus Garvey goes to prison, he leaves Henrietta Benton Davis in charge of UNIA, and that's some brother. When Malcolm mm -hmm. X goes overseas, he leaves the woman in charge of OAU. 
when right. Malcolm X died, his sister Ella became the president of OAU. Um, when the youth was trained to do the bus rides in the South, these were black women who organized that bus ride into the South and trained them into nonviolent tactics. You know, um, whether you ever look at civil rights leaders marching with Dr. King and others, you see all those black women right there marching. You see Sister Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi, the most terrorist state in America at the time, who had been abused mm -hmm. and raped in prison and beaten in all kinds right. of ways. She was sterilized and also. Won, yep. You know, mm -hmm. and forcing the Democratic Party convention to come to a halt. Nothing like yes. that had ever happened in the history of America at the convention yes. in Jersey. This black woman had been fierce throughout our history. Mm -hmm. She is our mother. And any foolish man would get caught up in some white dialectic foolishness and not understand right. your mama, your wife, your daughter, your sister, and you're caught up in some female demeaning, uh, minimizing process. You know something's wrong with you, so go on and fix yourself. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, so before before I played that clip, you were talking about the difference between the content and the intent. Right. The content and the intent. Talk, talk about that because you you we discussed that earlier today, and you're yes, talking sir. about the the two white female writers, Maria right. uh, Bello and the other one, uh, yes. their intent, and then what uh, Viola Davis and her husband Julius Tennant were able to do. Mm -hmm. Talk about that, please. Right. I haven't worked on a film. I've seen some of the best writers who are well-meaning people who have done good research and they're trying to write a black story, but they don't okay. come from our culture. They don't come okay. from our value system. They so these are not African-Americans. These may be white view. other ethnic groups. Right. They, just to be clear. Okay. Right. right. They don't have our worldview. Right. And they're trying to tell the story. And what they end up writing is their content about us. But that content mm -hmm. comes with an intent based on their value system and their worldview. And so I could see where Ms. Davis and her husband would have to look at that content, analyze its intent, and then use the kind the, the black, the knowledge of being an African to take that content and alter its intent, you see? And the right. way we see the design um, and you know, I can be critical, Michael, because when we first started, yes. I was getting ready to beat up on Sister Bioma and right. <laughs> I had me back, Brother Small, you need to go watch it, Brother Small, and I watched yep. it. And I, I told Professor Kaba, I told Professor Kaba the same thing. Yeah. Professor Kaba, yeah. I watched the comedy. I told him the same I thing. The work, and I know what they had to go to to accomplish the work. I know right. our history, because like you, I, I'm wrapped in history. That's my thing. I am history, right. you know, and right. I know the culture. Like if you look over my shoulder, you see Shango, the big guy standing there with all of my electors around his neck. Next to mm -hmm. Shango is my mother, Oya. Above Oya is the is the head of the Benin uh, prince that the European captured and don't want to give us back that head. Sitting at the bottom is the Ashanti um, god because I go nowhere without them. I immerse myself in the philosophy that surrounds them. And so, like Viola was talking about how she had to get in shape and be to do this movie, because you could see it was very challenging physically. Um, right. But you could see them meeting the challenge. And African culture, when, when you're trying to take the, the content written, even by Africans themselves, because you got to remember, colonization and slavery have altered our consciousness to such a degree right. that much of our content has the wrong intent because of value system and worldview. And if you want to bring a message to really talk about taking content and creating an intent that will bring a message that will show even in fiction the possibility of what the history of a people could have been and should have been. They had a job cut out for them and they met the challenge. Yes. They met the yeah, challenge. Yeah, I definitely agree. I definitely agree with that. Um, 
people talk of one of the things that uh, uh, I see on social media and in the media in general, and also this came up. So this is this movie comes out right around this right after Queen Elizabeth II dies, and then a lot of information comes out with the uh, British involvement in not just the transatlantic slave trade, but in colonizing a uh, little more than 25% of the world population. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so some people say things like, well, um, the British abolished the international transatlantic slave trade in 1807 and, uh, the, uh, the homemade, uh, didn't want to abolish it or, um, the British did the right thing or they, they try to make the British out to be saints or something like that. And it's like, wait a second, they got involved in 1562. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and they didn't. And in 1807, uh, when they, when they passed the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the slavery abolition act, uh, that just dealt with bringing Africans into their British colonies. It was still legal to have slavery in the British colonies. They didn't yeah. end that to 1834. Yeah, they didn't end slavery. Talk about that. Right. Yes. The British did not end slavery. Mm -hmm. What the British did was to interrupt the competition. Slavery okay. produced for Britain the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But now Correct. those who had free labor was challenging the wealth of the Industrial Revolution. So Britain mm -hmm. replaced its labor population with the Irish and the Scots who they were occupying, who had they, they had colonized in the British Isles. People don't even go back there. The Irish <laughs> right. and the Scots, this was their land. British people, people we call British people, these are Germans, Anglo and Saxons who invaded Anglos and these Saxons. people. All right? Right. And so now they realize in order to make the money they were they had already made all the money that all of the wealth that undergirds the industrial revolution in britain comes from the transatlantic slave trade all of them right they had no wealth right. before that of any significance okay right and so now they had that wealth they wanted to move in another direction in terms of wealth building and wealth creation but that was being challenged by these other states who was getting the wealth from slavery, from the slave trade. So France, who was the competition? Denmark, who was the competition? Spain, a competition? Pope, um, Portugal, and Germany. Britain had to find a way to minimize their ability to use wealth from the transatlantic slave trade to challenge British hegemony over the burgeoning industrial revolution. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Yes. You get it. Okay. Yes. So they trade chattel slavery for wage slavery mm -hmm. on the Irish and, and the Scots. And the they, Irish and the Scots. And then at the same time, they want to minimize the French developing their industrialization, and minimize the Portuguese and the Spanish to developing their industrialization. But to do that, you've got to then do what they went. Went out there with ships and said, and they only have three ships out there. Three ships that can patrol the whole Atlantic Ocean. Give me a break. Okay. So they, they went out there with ships and said, we're going to block you from trading, making money <laughs> off the slave trade, because that's going to make right. you wealthy enough to compete with us in this new industrial pro direction we are going in. And we're going to say we're doing something for humanity. But at the meantime, they still got people <laughs> enslaved, not just in Britain itself, but in all the British right. colonies around the world. Well, now, now we're going to take it a step further, and then, then I want to just show briefly some information dealing with the Industrial Revolution, because I do a whole presentation dealing with the uh, the uh, African American uh, origins or African American roots of uh, Labor Day history, and um, this goes back into the origins of the Industrial Revolution, starting in the 1790s in Manchester, England, and a lot of the cotton that was being produced at that time was produced by African slave labor. Mm -hmm. So. When, when we look at it, people can read this article here. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but read this article. It's a fact checker. It's from USA Today. I've talked about it before in the African History Network show. This deals with um, uh, United Kingdom finished paying off debts to slave-owning families in 2015, which they did. They had to take out a loan to pay. Now, what happened was when they abolished, um, uh, finally abolished slavery in 1834 in their colonies, uh, Britain pays um, 46,000 British slave owners, they paid them reparations. 
It's about 19 million pounds. I don't know what that translates to in dollars, but it's about 19 million pounds. Okay. And then they take out a loan to um uh pay to pay them. They just finished really paying off that loan and the interest, things like that in 2015. But uh this section here in the article in total, about 3.5 million uh African people were transported to British colonies across the Americas and Caribbean, though only 2.75 million survived the harrowing middle passage in the confines of slave ships across the ocean. So you, you would think the, the way a lot of this stuff is floating around, Professor Small, you would think it was Dahomey that sold 3.1 million Africans. Right. It, the, the, the British get, they, they get left off the hook. They get let off the hook. Mm -hmm. the, the, that, that's why <laughs> it's important for people to go watch this movie. Because yes. a homie is simply prototypical of African resistance, the movie. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. could have happened anywhere in Africa because it did happen everywhere in Africa. Right. Let me say it again. This could have happened anywhere in Africa because this type of resistance happened everywhere in Africa. You know? Yes. The resistance um, happened everywhere in yeah. Africa. And, and then also a lot of, a lot of African uh, ethnic groups, nations, we're given an ultimatum by Europeans. Either you provide us with African captives or we're going to take you also. Because the Europeans are coming with the ultimatum. They had a military presence station on the shore. That's what slave right. dungeons were. State slave dungeons were forts that housed right. their military with their cannons right. and their armament that they could come up with on any given day and wipe you out, which they did on many occasions. Right. So let's study the thing and understand it. I want my yes. brothers and sisters, especially African Americans, stop being cowards about learning your history. Don't come mm -hmm. tell me about the baseball game, the football game, and the basketball game, and who's got a girlfriend, who's got a boyfriend, what's this one stand, and what's this. And, and none of that takes any money home to your pocket. None of that right. transforms your consciousness and allow you to be a better person so you can raise your children in a safer world. History does that for you. History exactly. gives you a worldview. History gives you a perspective on your daily reality. History tells you who your friends and enemy has been and who your friends and enemies are today. Instead of you right. looking at yourself and hating yourself, you know, I hate the person that destroyed the image of yourself while you're restoring right. that image to yourself. And this takes study, but you don't have to study hard. I've got at least mm -hmm. 100 tapes on, on, on YouTube. Just go listen right. to Brother Small. It ain't going to cost you nothing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Go to right. the M Hotep's education channel. Tune into his mm -hmm. classes. Tune into Baba yes. Kaba's classes. Um, tune into Dr. Ma'at. You know, yeah. She will blow you away. You know, right. and you realize that people say, Well, where do I go to get the history? Just turn on your computer. <laughs> you don't have to turn on your computer, turn on your cell phone. All of us are going right. over your cell phone. Okay. Well, this is this is one of the reasons why I created the African History Network in 2010 to provide that uh, information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, very quickly here, and then we're going to wrap up. And I, I want you to let people know. Uh, I want you to give people your website and tell people about your courses coming up, anything like that as well. Mm -hmm. But very quickly, we talked about the Industrial Revolution. Now, this comes from the BBC. This is part of my presentation that I do dealing with the origins of uh, the Labor Day holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from BBC.co.uk, and you know they have. They have a lot of documentation uh, on all this, uh, the BBC. Um, uh, slave trade and the British economy. Uh, British profits were made from exporting manufacturing goods to Africa and importing products uh, of enslaved labor such as sugar. Uh, ports such as Glasgow, Bristol, and Liverpool, Liverpool, England, where the, Brit where the Beatles were from, mm -hmm. uh, and Liverpool prospered as a result of the slave trade. So they go through and they have um, all these charts and things like this but there's a there's a portion here uh dealing with cotton that i just want to focus in on um and i want to see if i can get to this okay they talk about this i can't okay let me see which page is this on uh they have these slides here which one is this okay this is three uh the role of the role of the trade in navigation and okay, this deals with manufacturing. Uh, so this one right here shows um, uh, economic growth and the industrial re revolution. Many historians describe the industrial revolution as a process rather than as an event. The, uh, the part that exports played 
can be shown as a virtuous circle. So exports uh, grow, industry grows, business owners invest and look for better machines. Machines get better, products get cheaper, exports grow. You, you have this cycle. They, were, they okay. were trying to corner the mark when they did this thing of mm -hmm. blockading slave trade. Because yes. they were trying to corner the market and the industrial revolution development and did not want the competition from the French, the Germans, the Spanish, and the others. But you right. can't do that unless you take away how they're making their money. You understand? Right. They don't abolish slavery now. They they said they're mm -hmm. abolishing slave the slave trade. So they're interdicting these ships. But that mm -hmm. is to knock the competition out of the game. And, and, right. and in the meantime, they take the African knowledge of how to make steel and become the premier steel makers in the world, right? And so the right. guy who founds Chase Bank, right? gets trained by the House of Rothschild, sent deliberately over to England because America was using um, the steel from Britain to build the railroads, to bring the cotton to the market, to feed the British cotton industry, textile industry. Mm -hmm. And so this, this well, and then so what they, what they began to do in America was instead of even though they were still bringing us in on ships and beating the blockade, they began to breed us over here. Right. Instead of After 1807, because the U.S., March 2nd, 1807, the U.S. Congress passes a bill to abolish the international transatlantic slave trade. Right. The U.S. involved. But not about that goes into effect. No, I understand. I understand. Right. Trust me. I, I understand. That goes into effect January 1st, 1808. Yes. Okay. That's based upon Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution right. that stipulated the earliest that the international transatlantic slave trade could be abolished was 1808. That means bringing Africans into this country to enslave them. So all the Africans... Now, here's the thing. They um, kept remember, doing that. that is to knock out the... Because America and Britain are right. partners in this. So they want yes. to knock out the competition, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Brandenburgs, mm -hmm. the, the Dutch. And by cutting that off from them... right. They, right, they, they're, they're cutting, cutting off the supply. Right, they're cutting mm -hmm. off the supply, and in right. in America, where they had a large enough piece of territory and a large enough black population, they could do go into the breeding process, and that's what they did. Right, and and what they did was it also increased the value of the African slaves that are already here because you're yeah. cutting off the supply right. as well. Now, now the other thing is they even though it was illegal after January first, eighteen oh eight, they kept bringing Africans oh, in right until the eighteen sixties. Right, right when the Clotilda comes in, right. So all the, the Africans, the one we know about, right. That's the that's the last right. known slave ship we know about. Yeah, and and that was because of a bet. Timothy Mayer yeah. was the white wealthy businessman who made a bet that he can smuggle Africans into the country. But all with the point I want one of the points I want to make: all the Africans that were brought to this country from January first, eighteen oh eight, through July of eighteen sixty, when the Clotilda comes in, all that was illegal based upon federal law. Right. Okay. So, to, so that helps to lay a legal foundation, not a moral foundation, mm -hmm. but a legal foundation for reparations because Europeans violated federal law. Also, there was a tax up to $10 paid for each African that was smuggled, that was brought to the country illegally as well. Mm -hmm. That's stipulated in the Constitution. OK, Article one, Section nine, Clause one. Now, um, and when and when we look at the uh, U.S. Supreme Court case of the Amistad, the United States versus the Amistad. Those Africans win their uh, freedom, Joseph St. Q and those other Africans mm -hmm. on the Amistad slave ship, they win their freedom in the U.S. Supreme Court because the U.S. Supreme Court rules that it, uh, it was um, it violated international treaties for those Africans to be captured. Mm -hmm. It was illegal for them to be brought into the country because the international transatlantic slave trade was abolished right. and they were they were given their freedom. Right. OK, so this is why we got to get we have to understand history and law. Right. And, and, and use this. The, Go ahead. From the very inception of the nation, slavery was, was legal. It was a part of mm -hmm. American law. America exactly. is completely culpable as a nation exactly. state yes. for the crimes against humanity committed against African peoples in the United States of America. Right. That's why they keep playing so many games. That's why I got to right. thank Sister Viola and thank her husband and thank our sister who was the director. Listen. Y'all just broke through a, a a a brick wall. Okay, you knocked right. the whole wall down. You know, Black Panther did a good job in cracking that mm -hmm. wall, but you just yeah. knocked the wall down because 
what you showed about that homing. And people can scream all they want about they sold us into slavery. You need to get on the ship, you know, get on the plane, go to Africa. If you can mm-hmm. go anywhere else on vacation, I see some of y'all going to Paris. That's cool. We want to say, I've been to Paris, you know what I'm saying? I've been to London and so forth and Bristol and Liverpool and Leeds and less and all of that stuff. But I've been to Africa. Mm-hmm. And I've listened to the elders. They still tell you the story of what they did. You can actually go to Benin, go to Dahomey, go to the very palace you see in the movie and sit there and the griots will tell you this history. Right. If you really want to know it. And the white folks are starting to say, oh, this little group of black folks sold all these millions of please. Exactly. So let's tell the real story and let's put the whole picture. Let's put Islam in there. I'm sorry to Salam Alaikum brothers. I was a Salam Alaikum brother too, I understand. But that's not mm-hmm. our religion. That was imposed right. on us just like Christianity. And many of the brothers, and to make it worse, many of the Arab Muslims were selling the black Muslims. There was actually a right. war in Africa between white Muslims and black Muslims. Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of us got sold into the slave trade. And you will find that a large percentage of black Muslims were sold into the United States of America by the white Muslims. Not some indigenous African in their home. Okay. Right. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because I know there was a, you had the Indian Ocean slave trade with uh, the Portuguese and the, and the Arabs. You, but you yeah, had that, but I'm you talking had that. about there's a whole concept dealing with the jihads of the 1700s mm-hmm. and the 1800s with the raiding down once the Ottoman Turks yeah. crushed the Fatimite dynasty at the end of the ninth century and mm-hmm. takes over Islam worldwide. The Ottoman went to war against Africa. This is what destroys Ghana, the ancient Ghana kingdom, and the Mali mm-hmm. and Sungai. It is the white Muslims declaring war on the black Muslims and selling us into right. slavery to the Portuguese and the Dutch. Right. We don't even talk right. about that because we have such sympathy for Malcolm X and the nation of Islam and Islam, but we need to talk about that. Yes. Yes, that and because that deals with uh, like uh, El Man El Mansur of Morocco uh, invading uh, Songhai in fifteen ninety one. Mm-hmm. That, that right there, and one of the things that now Doctor Jose Pimenta Bay talks about this in, in like the the book uh, Golden Age of the Moors, a fantastic book edited by Doctor Ivan mm-hmm. Serma. But Doctor Jose Pimenta Bay, who has an essay in that book, is, along with Renoko yeah. Rashidi, that's the beginning of it. The yeah. hands of the eighteen hundreds, and and. Is where you really see the explosion okay. of this. Okay. Um, with, right. With coming down through Nigeria, Cameroon, Ghana, you know, mm-hmm. that's how the Ashanti gets involved in this thing because they're, right. they're, they're, they're fighting with the kingdoms of the Arabized, Islamized kingdoms in northern Ghana encroaching on the hinterland of Ashanti. Okay. And the Ashanti is selling their prisoners of war. Right, captured in that conflict. The same thing right. with the Mose people of what is now Burkina Faso. Mose being an indigenous population, but fighting with the Islamic encroachment on what became Upper of Alta and later this. You see the same thing in Cote d'Ivoire with the right. Akan people of Cote d'Ivoire having and another ethnic nation having to fight this Islamic horde coming from the north. And of course, a lot of them end up being black because they're being converted the same way we're being converted to Christianity. But this is the Turkish Ottoman Empire and the Eastern Arab empires. And we don't even discuss it. And you're not going to understand West African transatlantic slave trade unless you know about the Sahara and the Indian Ocean and the East African Islamic slave trade that comes right down into the Western Sudan. Right. Because that goes back to about 8th century. Right. The great Chihuahuas. The great jihad. Okay. Uh, let me just show this quickly. And we're going to wrap up. Um, uh, this right. I want to go back to this. I, I was able to find what I was looking for. So this is dealing with the uh, slave trade and the British economy. This is dealing with the industrial revolution. 
this talks about uh, this section talks specifically about cotton. OK, um, uh, from 1750 onwards, a new industry emerged in Britain, the production of cotton cloth. Wool production had previously been Britain's major industry, but cotton had one key advantage. Machinery is better than wool. And then 1793, you have the uh, cotton gin invented here in the U.S. And then you're going to have copies of the cotton gin, which... Um, reduces the cost to producing uh, cotton. Uh, as a result, it was cotton production that the Industrial Revolution began. As a result, it was in cotton production that the Industrial Revolution began, particularly, particularly in and around Manchester, England. The cotton was uh, used, the cotton used was mostly imported from slave plantations. Slavery provided the raw material for industrial change and growth. So when we talk about this industrial revolution, mm -hmm. the foundation of that was the cotton that African slaves grew. Absolutely. Uh, go, go, go ahead, Professor Small. Well, no, you just you just laid it out. And the thing that mm -hmm. people must understand is that the, the, the American mm -hmm. banking system was tied in to the British banking system. Full partnership. Yes. J.P. Morgan Chase comes out of a tutelage by the House of Rothschild in London. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they were involved in selling the steel to America, right? To create the rail lines to move the cotton, the cotton to the docks, to put on the ships to send to England. Okay. All tied up, all wrapped up in one neat package. And so when right. they talk about they 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 were blockading Africa to stop the slave trade, yeah, they were trying right. to knock out their competition in the Industrial Revolution. Exactly. Let's exactly. Get, let's get it straight. Yep. Um, and everybody, you can uh, this other article here you can check out. I showed it on the screen briefly. I didn't give the I didn't give the name of it. This is a, a really good article. This is from SmithsonianMag.com, so Smithsonian Institute. Uh, this deals with. Uh, the uh, real warriors behind the woman king, the real warriors behind the woman king, September 15, 2022. It goes through, it's about, I printed out the, all these articles I print out. I have thousands of articles printed out. Uh, so it goes through all this uh, history and, and it, it, it deals with uh, where the movie opens in uh, 1823 also. Okay, uh, yeah, because it talks about right here, uh, it opens in 1823 with a successful raid uh, by the Agoji who freed captives from uh the enslavement from the clutches of the oil empire, a powerful Europa state. Okay, so it talk. So it starts with the opening of the movie. Uh, okay, Professor Small, look, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, once again, I know uh, you. you I, I've um, taken one of your online classes you taught a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was dealing with the Yoruba, uh, right, some of the, right. the Ifa things like this. So uh, give people your website address. Let people know about how they can support you, DVD lectures, courses that you offer, things like that. Yeah, well, right now you can go to my website, uh, professorjamesmall.com. Um, and right. then uh, my Facebook page, which is very popular, is professorsmallafricanworld.com. Um, Facebook is messing with me for some reason for the last few weeks, but I've been too busy to deal with them. With them. I don't know what I okay. said that got them upset. They're blocking all my, my pages and stuff. Um, but I'll get I'll get it soon when I get time to deal with them. Uh, but you go to my website and then my my email is A M P O N S A three at gmail.com. A M P O N S A the number three at gmail.com. Um, I will be starting classes again, starting at the beginning of 2023. I want to finish okay. this, 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 uh, Godfather of Harlem piece, um, which we should be finished at the end of October. Um, it should be coming out, uh, the first week in January. It's better than the last two by a hundred miles. Mm -hmm. You're going to love it, right? Because we, exactly. we got more courage. We got braver. You're going to see Ernesto Che Guevara. You're going to see Che Guevara and Malcolm. You're going to see the CIA trying to kill both of them. You're going to see the FBI plot Malcolm's assassination. I put it all out there. We're going to <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and you as the historical consultant, you go through and you review the script. 
you let them know okay it didn't happen this way this is not realistic things like that that's 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 your job on the show because at the end of the, at the end of each show when you watch the credits your name is in the credits go ahead right. so I, I work with uh some brothers uh chris Blancato, who is the showrunner and the chief writer i mean beautiful mm -hmm. guy and michael and and and, and paul who's a brother out in california we can solve them concepts, ideas, and principles. Like, how does this concept look? Like, right now, right. what are we doing? We're trying to figure out, how do we do the assassination without replicating Spike Lee or replicating other movies about the assassination? I can't tell you what we're going to do, but it's going to be very right. unique. And we're not going to see... And my thing was, I don't want to see him getting shot. How do we right. handle that? Right. How, how the writers handle it is just beautiful, right? Um, but still tell the story as accurately as you can, right? Exactly. To keep the dignity of Sister Betty and the children and the family, you know. Um, um, showing Malcolm as a diplomat. We have, we, we, we've got him in Mecca, all right? Mm -hmm. we, we've got him in Ghana giving a speech. To, and we got him in Cairo speaking to All that's going to be up in there. we got to meet with right. Guevara. You know, we, 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 we've got a meeting with Kwame Nkrumah. So you're gonna see stuff that no one else has shown. Okay. And then we got right. this relationship between him and Bumpy Johnson, his friend, trying to keep him alive and trying to protect him. Then we bring the CIA mm -hmm. into play you know, through the Cuban drug lords, right, into Harlem. And then we get the FBI coming in, wanting to stop Malcolm. But see, that gets hidden in other pieces. They talk about the next right. this land, but they don't talk about these other forces. So we're gonna deal with mm -hmm. other forces big time out front. You know, uh, I, I, I deal with this uh, in my classes. Um, there's a good article, uh, and you just you just hit on a little bit of this. There's a good article by Denine L. Brown for um, the Washington Post. It deals with the day Dr. King met Malcolm X, March 26, 1964, at the U.S. Senate debate uh, for the Civil Rights Act. Martin Luther King Jr. met Malcolm X just once. The photo still still haunts us with what was lost. But what what the, well, what I want to hit on got him down point. in Selma in the movie. We got him doing the speech yeah. in Selma. We got a meeting with yep. Andy Young. We got a meeting with Coretta. Mm -hmm. We're gonna tell the story right. hard. Well, well, Malcolm gets in. Well, what I was gonna hit on when Malcolm officially separates from the Nation of Islam, March eighth, nineteen sixty four. Malcolm gets involved in the civil rights movement. Right. Okay. And that's and that and that's a part of Malcolm's life that's not talked about a lot. You got to do some research to understand this. You can't right. just quote excerpts of Malcolm's speeches. And Malcolm, the battle of the bullet that he first delivers that I know of, March 29th, 1964, uh, in Washington Heights, New York. One of the things he's talking about in the in the speech is interjecting black nationalism into the civil rights movement. Right. Okay. He he actually uh, has a meeting in 65. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Ruby Dee's brothers, Tom's house in Queens. And mm -hmm. he meets with all of the civil rights leaders head. The only one that didn't make it was Dr. King, but Dr. King, said, right? He sent his rep. A, all right. And, Sarah, and they agreed yeah. that they would work together. And Fanny Mahima, who was at that mm -hmm. meeting, invites him to come to Mississippi, a lecture mm -hmm. that would have taken place of two weeks after he was assassinated. Right, right. In the documentary, Make It Plain, they talk about that, but they said it was at Juanita Poitier's house. No, it was, In the docu it was Tom's house. Tom's house? Okay. Tom's house. And, and what was his relation to Ruby D? His brother. That's Ruby D's brother. Ru Ruby D's brother. Okay. Ozzie Davis's Ru wife and Ruby right. D. Right. They were right. very close to Mount, that whole family. Right. Close. So exactly. And, Elefante, of course. He was, you know, both right. men were. Because they, they had this meeting. Uh, they had this meeting uh, with the civil major civil rights leaders and Malcolm, so they could put all their differences out on the table and work together. Mm -hmm. That's what the that's basically yeah. what the meeting. And this is about. what this is what forced Hoover to get more aggressive towards Malcolm's removal. Mm -hmm. Hoover, if you think he had an issue with Dr. King being a messiah, now Malcolm and Dr. King talking about uniting. This guy's obviously gone crazy in D.C. at this time. Right. And he gave that's when he gave that order to do something about him. Well, what do, you can't buy him, he won't take your money, you can't frighten him. What does do right. something about Malcolm X mean? Right. You know? Th this is what I was getting at. When when they met, uh they only met for a couple of minutes. When they met, mm -hmm. Malcolm told Dr. King, I'm throwing myself into the heart of the civil rights struggle. 
This is and this is what Malcolm was doing. And one of the things that Malcolm talked about in the Battle of the Bullet is uh, registering African Americans in Harlem to vote as independents. Mm -hmm. And he's going through talking about the the importance of understanding politics and getting involved politically. Uh, and then uh, June 28, 1964, when he delivers his speech um, announcing the formation of the organization Af of Afro-American unity, the, the speech that people call by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. He lays out this five point uh, platform and he talks about voter registration in there. He talks about economics, mm -hmm. of course, and education, but he talks about pol uh, political engagement and voter registration as well and, and well, understanding well, how to leverage that was not new with Malcolm because when he was still in the nation Correct. he was working trying to work with the Freedom Now Party but the messenger stopped it. Mm -hmm. so right he, he, he right. Exactly. Been trying to have and, that and, kind of engagement but the nation wanted to remain mm -hmm. a religious organization and not a political organization that was part of the well, you know that got him separated from the nation Exactly. And, you know, July 31st, uh, 1963, Malcolm sends a letter. Uh, he's in the Nation of Islam. He sends a letter to the leading civil rights organizers, including Dr. King, and he's requesting a meeting with them in, in uh, that's going to take place in Harlem, New York. I think it was August of uh, 67, right around that time, August of 63. Uh, and, and he's calling Malcolm was calling for a unification of the civil rights leaders and their followers. He, he said that we have to uh, find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. This is what Malcolm was doing while he's in the nation. He's calling for unification of the civil rights leaders and their followers. He's, he's, he's saying that we should be able to submerge our minor differences, the Negro leaders, submerge our minor differences to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. And this is what we need to do today, brother. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and so when you read that, I wish you'd send me that article. I like to take it to my article. I'll send it to you. I've got thousands yeah. of articles, yeah. Professor Small. Well, Seriously, I'll send it to you. Right around those issues right now. Mm -hmm. And see, when you see that, then you understand why the split with the nation. You see the hand of Cointel Pro. Right. Okay. Right. Cointel Pro is well at work in the nation at this time. And the one thing they want to do is destroy the partnership between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. And they were able to effectively yes. do that in November 63. And once they got him yes. out, they went to work to make sure they could never get back together. And then as Malcolm right. slides, as he does, the moving partner with Dr. King, they killed him. And that just mm -hmm. Yep. It's exactly exactly well look brother it's been fantastic people have learned so much uh everybody support uh uh professor james small and uh support the uh african history network again here's his website uh, uh professor james small.com professor james small.com and then uh, his cash app also is dollar sign uh dr james small dr dollar sign dr james small uh, and then uh, be sure to support the African History Network as well. Well, look, brother, it's been fantastic. Yeah. I know you got to run. Let's, I got to go just ahead. Come back and call out uh, the woman king. That's why we came together. And people should go uh -huh. and go watch ahead. it. It's an extraordinary mm -hmm. document. Um, it's a good movie if you just want to be entertained with some really fantastic um, acting. But if you want to have your right. African melanin stimulated this will do it i guarantee it. absolutely you come away you'll come away blown away by this movie you'll come away wanting to learn more yeah. about african right. history and who you right. are that's that's what that's what happened with malik that's so powerful i'm going to do my uh dna uh sometimes so i'm going to use african ancestry yeah i, uh, I did african ancestry i haven't i did my myochondria which is my grandma and that's 100 percent right there leon but I knew my great grandma mm -hmm. who came from West Africa. And I knew my great great grandfather, okay. my great papa, great, my great grandfather who came from East Africa uh, on my grandma's mm -hmm. side. Um, she was the root woman, the Yoruba priestess, you know, the dada and the plantation I grew right. up on. Um, so it was just so much of it is like, yep. wow. I mean, like I said, I don't cry in movies. These people had me crying. I mean, the tears. <laughs> right. Me too. I shared some my, tears at my, the my end too. It was like I almost lost my breath a couple of times and, and stunning 
<laughs> the way they did the essays and solve, um, uh, you know, the conflict resolution that they brought about uh, with the situation mm -hmm. that was clear, the problems, how they solved the problems. Um, let me explain to you what I'm saying. When, you, when you're making a movie, you create problems, you create contradictions. And the movie is about how right. you bring resolution to the contradictions, right? They just do a fantastic job of it. Exactly, exactly. And Miss, Miss Davis is just, when you see her, she is mm -hmm. the woman king. When you see her, she is the right. warrior general leader. No doubt about it. Naniska, yep, yep. And Naniska was a real a goji, yeah. but she wasn't a general. Yeah. So uh, I, I listened to the interview. I've listened to a number of interviews that uh, Gina Prince Bythewood, the uh, director has done uh, as well as Viola Davis and Gina Prince Bythewood said that the character of, of Naniska was an amalgamation. Yeah. Well, that, it's a combination of most, different most heroine and heroes. When you yes. deal with fictionalized, fictionalized history, it is an amalgamation mm -hmm. of multiple characters. Um, right. And that's how you make it work. And they made it work because like I said, this could have happened anywhere in Africa and it did happen in multiple places in Africa. And so right, exactly. if you want something to, and people are upset and saying, oh, this is fiction, then go study the history and tell me, tell me the story. Study the real history. <laughs> yep. That's why we're doing this yeah. show that deal with the real history because you, what happens is movies that have a historical foundation, but a lot of fiction in them, it causes people to want to know more. more. Yes about the real history that's why i'm doing this show that's why i contacted professor small i i i contacted uh sylvian dioff who wrote it who wrote fighting the slave trade i'm trying to get in touch with her i talked to dr uh talitha lafloria who wrote um uh, who's the author of uh this book here we've had her on the show before uh chained in silence black women and convict labor in the new south mm -hmm. dr T uh, uh talitha lafloria we, we've had I'm her here on the after history network show before yeah, and uh, she she had not seen the movie yet. She wants to see it, so I'm gonna try to get her on. We're gonna try to get some sister scholars on also as well. No, this, this, okay, this brother, look, work. go ahead. Good work, good work, good work uh, to the whole crew. Yeah, and what they've done is raised the bar in terms of mm -hmm. the kind of pieces that will now be presented to the black community about our history. Um, Right. And if they don't give her the Academy Award, I'm gonna have to suit up and boot up and go out to Hollywood and handle it. She deserves it. Absolutely. And you know, uh, uh, director uh, Gina Prince Bythewood, she credits the success of the film Black Panther for opening the door. So for this movie to be funded, they, they, this has a $50 million budget. Mm -hmm. She credits the film Black Panther because Black Panther did 1.3 billion worldwide. Mm -hmm. Number one movie for five weeks in a row. She cred credits the success of that movie for being able to open the door for them to be able to do this mm -hmm. movie. Okay, so so that's powerful. Well, look, brother, I know you got to yes, run. Man. So thanks for taking your time out of your busy schedule, man. We'll talk soon, and and um, we'll, we'll talk about your classes. Okay, also, brother okay? Michael, thank you for inviting me. I always right, enjoy peace. my time with you. Peace and blessings. Me too, brother. <laughs> All right, okay. hotel. Peace, peace, family. Okay, everybody, that was one of my teachers, Professor James Small as well. Don't go away. We'll be here for a couple more minutes. Um, I teach online history class, two things. Uh, teach online history classes and my radio show will be on tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. We just did two two hours, 15 minutes here. I got to do it. I have to get ready to do a two-hour radio show, my main radio show, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, WFDF. But um, if you visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, this is our new website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. If you go to our old website, which is africanhistorynetwork.com, it'll redirect here. Information about the radio show is here. Download the iHeartRadio app or the TuneIn app on your smartphone. You can listen live Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Click here to listen to audio podcasts of our shows. Uh, and also we broadcast on Facebook and YouTube uh, when I'm on live. Uh, uh, PayPal, Cash App information is here as well. Um, and then uh, I teach online history classes, okay? And this really helps support the African History Network and finance what we do, okay? Because it takes a lot to be able to do this. is a, a lot of expense, different services out to pay for. So I teach an eight-week online class called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. 
Um, this class is scheduled uh, for Thursdays, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next class is uh, uh, September 29th. The class is on sale $80, regularly $130. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. OK, you click right here to register here. You can pay by debit card, credit card or PayPal. If you want to pay by cash app, just email me through the website. Just click on contact the African History Network right through the website. Email me and we can set it up where you can do it through cash app. OK, because uh, sometimes people just send me money through cash app and I don't know what it's for. If you if you send um uh you could send it to cash up i need your email address to enroll you in the class so yeah just email me because i want to keep the money straight just email me if if you want to do it through uh, cash app okay but we do a thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade we go through this history chronologically as much as possible i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips some of the slides that i showed uh when we were speaking with professor small come from the class the second class that i teach we do this on tuesdays normally tuesdays um i did a session today uh before so i did an hour of this class today then we did professor small or did the interview with him for two hours then i have to do a two-hour radio show today also this evening um from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 and uh this is on sale 80 dollars record 130 dollars also click here to register here takes you to the next page and just click on enroll you can watch from around the world uh this one here we deal with history starting in 1803 with the louisiana purchase and the haitian revolution and we go through our history chronologically to um understand what happened what leads to the civil war taking place what happened to us after slavery ended what were the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament that we're in now to, to better understand where we need to go from here okay so that is uh from the civil war the second class is from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 i created both of these classes i created the curriculum professor small is one of my teachers um i've been studying history 30 years this is a book there are two binders of articles information that i use to teach the class this is uh one of those binders so today we dealt with uh uh one of the things we talked about we started talking about was uh the uh texas revolution in uh 1836 okay so this is one of the uh articles from the class the texas revolution 1836 uh next class we're going to get into the mexican-american war uh 1846 1848 uh texas becoming a state in the union 1845 we also talked about vicente guerrero uh today who became um the first president of african descent of mexico in 1829 uh, 1829 and he abolishes slavery in 1829 okay so we talked about uh, uh him as well in the class and we talked about the missouri compromise of eight of um 1820 which is one of the things that leads to this uh, civil war taking place and it was uh something that was designed to uh, avoid a civil war also the missouri compromise of uh 1820 we'll talk about things like the compromise of 1850 uh as well which consisted of five bills and the compromise of 1850 was designed to organize the land that the u.s gets from mexico through what's known as the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo it's the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ends the Mexican-American War in 1848. And the U.S. gets California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada from Mexico uh, as a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. They pay about $15 million for that. Uh, Mexico loses one-third of their territory. And then the uh, the Missouri Com the Compromise of 1850 organizes that land that the u.s gets from mexico but the fifth bill consisted of five bills the fifth bill was the fugitive slave act of 1850 which intensifies intensifies the abolitionist movement makes it more dangerous for one runaway slaves to stay in the north more of them are going to go into canada um so this is a fantastic class and we go through we look at uh what leads to the civil war taking place we look at the reconstruction era 1865 1877 jim crow era world war one world war ii great migration 1915 and 1970 civil rights movement black power movement okay uh, we have a bundle pack when you can register for both classes at a discount 
you get both classes for uh, $130. That's an over $300 value because there's going to be bonus lectures that you get from me in digital format that we're uploading also. So right here, we have uh, the bundle uh, bundle pack of courses. You can click right here to register here for it. And if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me at uh, AHN show at the African History Network .com, or just email me right through the website. Click on contact the African History Network, AHN show at uh, the African History Network .com, and uh, you'll get a 50% discount on the bundle pack if you are a returning student. And I've been teaching these online classes going back to uh, 2017. Uh, I created uh, the course Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'a for Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. There's a big binder that I use for that also that has a lot of the information in it. And um, this one here, you know, with Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power, I started teaching that. I think it was October 2021. OK. All right. And uh, we'll be on live tonight. The African History Network show. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, follow the African History Network, the AHN show. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the African History Network on Facebook. Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. Uh, you can support us through Cash App and PayPal. Some people don't get the notifications uh, on Facebook. So, you know, check check the our fan page, you know, regularly. Uh, we appreciate this. Oh, also those two classes, you can use that information with your children. I forgot to tell you that. Uh, the classes, I would say, are PG-13. They're not overly graphic. I don't do a lot of cursing, things like that. OK, so you can use that information with your children. You can watch from around the world uh, also. OK. And even after the course is over with, you still have uh, full access to the class. So you're from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. It doesn't it doesn't expire. Uh, your access to the class does not expire because the could um, because the course is over with. All right. OK, look, I got to get ready to do this two hour radio show. Uh <laughs> It's been a busy week and I have a new work schedule and trying to get used to all that. So I said, I talked to Professor Small. I said, look, let's do this. We'll do it uh, today and then I'll do my radio show tonight. We'll play excerpts of this interview on my show tonight. OK. All right. Remember, right now, let's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you.